uh, the legacy, but also of the thought of Murray Bookchin, but also the future directions for social ecology, um, related forms of activism, municipal libertarian municipalism. And for this, uh, for this session today, uh, we will talk more deeply into uh, the themes of nature and ecology. So this session, today's session, uh, will be split in, uh, in two panels. Then we will have a break. And after the break, uh, the last session of this uh, day, of the, the second day of the conference, will be dedicated to uh, future research. So methodologies, more links uh, with uh, academic forms of, uh, of investigation. First and second with uh, book presentations. We will finish this conference with book presentations. And Magali, another TRIS member, will be chairing this uh, second session after the break. So right now, we will start, therefore, with the first panel uh, on uh, nature and ecology. So we are very happy to welcome uh, our three speakers today. So welcome to Yanis, Jordan, and Laura. They will be presenting on uh, various themes uh, that interconnect. And uh, hopefully, there will be an uh, interesting discussion that follows. So for those of you that are on Zoom, uh, feel free to uh, raise your hand and to ask your questions directly uh, verbally after the, the talks. Uh, for those of you that are in the chat, it, uh, it's OK too. And for those of you that are on YouTube, uh, you can also put your questions on the chat and we will uh, uh, link them here in our discussion. So. Um, without intro more in introductory words, I am happy to give the, the word to Yanis Perperidis, who will uh, talk to us about uh, the connection between Bookshin, Murray Bookshin and Andrew Fenberg, searching for techno technological alternatives for the sake of the environment. Yanis, you have the word. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the conference committee for the opportunity. And so, while searching Bookchin's uh, work, I came across an article of his called The Liberatory Technology. While first reading it, since I'm studying technology, I was shocked. It was written back in 1965, and when you read it, it feels like reading an article from within the technology studies field that emerged much later. Now, I'm not going to analyze just books in the article, though I encourage you all to read it if you haven't. But what I'm going to do is to try and reconcile it with the more recent philosophy of technology, that of Andrew Finberg, because I think that there are some, let's call them, mistakes that books in, couldn't have known back in the 60s, because they emerged as mistakes from the field of science and technology studies two decades later. I think that Bookchin's project or vision, which is truly fascinating, can be actualized today. But in order to do this, it needs to be supplemented with a strong termi uh, terminology and notions of a more recent philosophy of technology. And that, I think, can be provided by Andrew Finberg's critical theory of technology. In his article, Bookchin uh, highlights that technology has reached a point where it can support another way of life, a more communitarian and uh, decentralized life lifestyle, what he himself calls as ecological forms of human associations. He offers examples based on the fact that machines can be smaller but as well as efficient. Factories and many other plants needs to need, need no huge machinery and so can be centralized and managed by small communities. In the article he gives many examples and many times he refers to what it will be, how Janice, your microphone seems to be uh, off. We don't hear you anymore. Can you? Do you hear there. me now? Yes, perfectly. Thank you. Um, so you heard nothing. No, no, no. It just it just uh, got turned off uh, thirty seconds ago. So if you can just repeat oh, okay, the, okay. the last yeah, minute. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, so, um, in his article, he offers examples based on the fact that machines can be smaller, but as well as efficient. Factories and many other plants need no huge, no huge machinery, but uh, 
and so they can be decentralized and managed by small communities. And she gives many examples, and many times she refers to uh, to the way it will be after technology has been used differently. The mistakes that I referred earlier lie in this argument. Bookchin uh, writes about different uses of technology. A significant question to which uh, he poses, which he poses is, and I quote, how can the new technology and resources be used in an ecological manner? End of the quote. And now, since one of the prevailed readings of the technological progress within the 20th century was that technology is neutral and can be used in a variety of ways according to the aims that the users incorporate, there is the danger of misreading these ideas of Wuxin as a kind of instrumental approach to technology, and this would be unacceptable, because by doing this, the radical potential of Wuxin's theory might be lost. Sometimes, in his article, Wuxin speaks of uh, new technology, only to culminate in different uses. This latter is what I will try to clear from Wuxin's theory through the reconciliation with Finberg. We need projects and visions like that of Wuxin, but we need it with a concrete philosophy of how to achieve it. And Finberg's theoretical account might be the solution. Now, Andrew Finberg is one of the leading intellectuals in the field of philosophy technology today, and he was a student of Herbert Marcuse, from which he draws many of his basic ideas. But Marcuse's new type of man was criticized by many as utopianism, utopianism, and so his vision seems obsolete today. Finberg draws upon some of his basic ideas about technology, that the technology is always political and it's never neutral, but he develops his own approach by reconciliating critical theory with science and technology studies. The result is a concrete philosophy of technology with fo which focuses not on macroanalysis, but integrates specific examples of technologies and then highlights the social and political structure of today's society. It is, as Finberg calls it, a reconciliation of modernity studies, let's say a, a project or a vision about an alternative modernity, and science and technology studies, which provide the basis of, the, um, of another technology or another design. Um, but in contrast with Marcuse's vision, I think that Buxin's project is not obsolete, but can be realized. Social ecology is alive today and may co suggest solutions to our problems. Uh, in the remaining now of my presentation, I am going to explain some of the most important notions of Finberg's theory, and then I am going to show how these notions should, could supplement Buxin's theory. May this first encounter, uh, I think it's the first, I haven't seen it. Uh, anywhere. Um, whoever knows if someone has already tried to reconcile Finberg and books, and I am pleased to learn it. May this first encounter with, encounter with the thought of these two great thinkers inspire more writings on the reconciliation of social ecology and critical theory of technology. Now, um, Finberg's philosophy of technology is opposed to every kind of determinism. He thinks that technological determinism is a kind of illusion that emerges out of a technological unconscious that veils the social character of technology. This unconscious hides the fact, the fact that technology is not created somewhere far from human users, within a lab, let's say, full of technicians and scientists. On the contrary, technology for Finberg is created through the users who affect it. But this kind of creation is complicated, of course. However complicated, it is manifested from empirical examples. Finberg argues that, and I quote, the environmental movement has had a major impact on the understanding of technology, transforming private, uh, privately held supposedly neutral technical information into grist for public controversy, end of quote. In order to deal with determinism and the technocracy that determinism thesis implies, Finberg turns to science and technology studies and more specifically to social constructivism. His aim is to unveil the technological unconscious, making the process of uh, affecting technology conscious in order for even more social groups to understand their power to affect the technological design. Thus, Finberg develops <clears throat> excuse me, uh, what he calls technical politics. The fact that technological design is political 
from the beginning of the process of creating it. Finberg thinks that there exists what he calls as technical codes that determine what affordances a technical artifact will have and to what aims they will be pointing at. These codes are something like Kuhn's paradigms. paradigms. They include values that become facts. This is a revolutionary aspect for technological design. It means that values and facts are not distinguishable, but rather that values become facts and affect the technology that will be created. Human values are not excluded from the process of designing or of the designing of a techno, uh, technical artifact, but rather they are translated into technical specifications that will later be included within the very design of an artifact. This translation, uh, translations is uh, of the greatest importance. Technicians are in the middle of two ends. From the one side, the technology that they will create, and from the other side, the needs of the people using this technology with the values and meanings that they create about their world, their society. So technicians for Finberg translate values into facts in order for technology to correspond to the prevailed technical code. Um, it is easy to understand that technicians somehow create the facts that penetrate the design of the uh, technical artifacts. Social constructivism has shown that facts and reality is also created within the lab. But what is being translated, in, what is being translated into facts? What value, which values? Finberg develops the idea that there are what he calls participant interest, and this is of much importance. The interest of the social groups that use a specific technology and are able to affect it. The democratization of technology, uh, the ultimate aim, let's say, of uh, Finberg's theory, uh, means that widening the affection, uh, the affection circle, that technological design is affected by social groups that couldn't affect it before. Participant interests apply what Finberg calls the cultural horizon of the technological artifact. One could understand this horizon through the notions of, uh, let's say, social imaginary of Castoriadis. Um, this is what uh, the cultural horizon is. Humans create their world of meanings and through this process they create their society. By appropriating meanings and recreating them, they recreate their world. Technology could not remain untouched, of course. If a societal meaning changes, so does the technology that used to correspond to it. There is no pure, rational technology, one that is based on mere facts. The facts of today are the values that were, in some point, translated into facts. So this, the, the social imaginary, the meanings and values that create the human society, are translated into facts and technical specifications. Now, in order to become aware of the significance of all of this, of this analysis, one should understand the importance of who affects the, te the technology. And this, uh, this is one of the points that Buxin tries to highlight in his, um, uh, in his article. Finberg analyzes what he calls the bias of technology. Technology is not neutral. It is not just a tool that one may use for their own purposes. Since the neutrality thesis is dismissed, how can one argue that technology is unfair for a portion of the population? Finberg thinks that every technological artifact is indeed based towards a group's interests. Participant interests now become even more important. Whoever affects technology, the more, turns its, its design toward their, their interests. For Finberg thus, it is not so much a question of how the same technology will be used differently. Um, so it's not, a, uh, um, it's not a question of, of different uses, but it's a question of toward which interests technology is going to be biased. Democratizing technology means that technological design will include the interests of as many social groups as possible in order for unfair technology to not be produced. Since technology recreates the world along with humans, then whoever affects the design, technological design, affects also the shape of the society. Moreover, the fact that we live in a technological society renders these remarks even more important. But with the democratization of technology thesis, Finberg 
uh, opens up the possibility that every social group may in turn affect the shape of the technology by affecting the design of technology. And this is, I think, a revolutionary mark. Um, now, an important question arises. Is this theory just one more utopian thinking? Um, is it just abstract thinking that cannot be um, uh, actualized? It is reasonable to ask this because technology is perceived today as a force above human control. The fact is that the affection of technological design is not an easy task. Finberg is not delusional. Users do not just um, send emails to technicians or speak with them directly, delivering their requests. We don't request a technology and then it is built. For the technical code to be altered, the process is much the same as for the social imaginary to be changed. Finberg refers to some practices through which societal and technological change may occur. Um, he speaks of hearings or, or technical controversies, protests, legal challenges, or even hacking and more. Such ways contribute as resistances to the technological regime that the participant interest of some prevailed groups established for all the others. Um, Finberg turns to Foucault and Michel de Sorteau theories in order, in order to show that the truth of the reality is in fact the truth imposed by the prevailed social group, and it is a truth um, that is oppressive for, for, some, for some groups. So, um, and I am concluding in a short, um, in order to show all of the above in a more practical way, Finberg occasionally refers to environmental problems because it is there that the above mentioned processes manifest themselves. The environmental crisis is for Finberg a strong reminder that technology is not neutral and moreover that human is not God. Only God could not receive feedback from his actions. Human's actions um, through technology always get feedback, but the very essence of technology is to absorb it and hide it from the user. It would be irrational to hammer a nail and instantly feel pain. The hammer would not be useful. On a small scale, the absorption of feedback may not have a huge impact, but on a larger scale, the effects of technology of modern industry cannot be absorbed fully by the technology. They manifest themselves through environmental catastrophes. Along with this, what are emerging are the values that have been translated into technical facts. It's the values of profit and efficiency, the values of capitalist enterprise. And to conclude with, and I'm returning to Buxin's art, Buxin's article and this reconciliation between the two thinkers, Buxin's project for decentralized eco-communities is radical and very important. But it is not only a matter of different uses of technology. It's not that um, the very same capitalist technology um, can be used in another uh, in another um, matter, and uh, we will uh, lead we will lead to eco communities by changing our social imaginary with the values of a decentralized community with a different lifestyle, with different habits, ideas, um, or the the very design of technology will also be changed because these new values will be translated into a new technical code, into new technical facts. We can't use the capitalist technology for decentralized eco-communities simply because we can't have such communities with the notions, the rationality and the values of capitalist societies. As science and technology studies have shown, technology and society co-construct one another. The environmental crisis has shown that today's technology damages the environment. This doesn't mean that using it differently will alter this fact. The struggle for a better and healthier environment is a social struggle, and uh, as is the struggle for a more human technology. There is a need uh, for change of the technical code of modernity. There is a need for changing, for change of the values of our society. And I think through uh, these thinkers that it is us who can save uh, our societies and our climate and our planet. So um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this interesting uh, intervention, Yanis. Um, so we will take questions for all the speakers afterwards. Uh, so now we welcome uh, Jordan to, to uh, 
to talk. He will talk to us about the social ecological context uh, of Los Angeles and particularly its water continental water system. So Jordan, you have the word. Awesome. Thank you so much, Thea, and thank you so much for everyone who's talked so far at the conference. It's been really inspiring. And as a young person, I really do love all the inspiration. Um, so for my talk today, I will be talking to you guys about uh, one second. There we go. Um, is everyone able to see that all right? Perfectly. Yes, I think it works. Awesome. Thank uh, you. So my presentation today is about uh, using Bookchin's dialectical naturalism in a very localized and specific context so that we can see how we can start building a better world from the you know, presuppositions of capitalist modernity. Um, so real quick, before I start, who am I and why am I here? I am a UCLA senior um, and I uh, am currently studying ecology and evolutionary biology. Um, and I, I really focus on the scientific side of this. Um, however, I, in the last two years, have been focusing much more on the historical and environmental nature of the world and how it's come to be, um, specifically because science alone cannot explain the problems that are facing our world today. Um, I entered social ecology through the lens of water, taking a course on the anthropology of water, and I began asking questions about colonization of water and how people control water. Uh, Murray Bookchin helped me understand different um, trajectories, both in the past and the future, and how we can use both you know, environmental history and social ecology to synthesize and explore potential futures for the world. Um, why study nature in Los Angeles? Um, a lot of people say Los Angeles is an anti-nature or um, a, a very unnatural artificial landscape, but Los Angeles is actually one of the biggest cities in the world, um, especially in the, Los in, in the American West. It's the American megalopolis there. Um, in the late 19th and 20th century, as the United States expanded beyond the, the North American continent into the Pacific, uh, Los Angeles was the city that was rising with this. Um, and that can really be seen today with the port of Los Angeles being the biggest port in, Los in, in America. Um, and because of that, the understanding how urbanization functions within the landscape is really important. Um, and if we can learn how to live in Los Angeles ecologically, we, we can learn how to do so anywhere. Um, so how do we use dialectical naturalism in a local context and what is that value? Um, dialectical naturalism allows us to use a landscape as a, an ever constant or an ever changing unity. Um, using a dialectic allows us to look at specific both cultural and biological actors um, and see how they interact with change on a landscape. Um, my paper specific, specifically looks at how colonial and settler colonial ideologies um, interact with how people see and conceptualize the landscape, as well as how they construct and modify the landscape towards specific human ends. Um, why focus on water? Water is life, and without water, there is no ecosystems. Uh, water is a resource not just for humans, but for all life, and it's always been that way. Um, the ends by which we manipulate water, though we cannot control water because it is not, it's a constantly in flux resource, uh, tells a lot about how we conceptualize our role in the environment in our cities, as well as uh, with the environment as a whole. Um, and by looking at water in Los Angeles, a city that has been shaped both by drought and by floods, we can really begin to see how water interacts with our cities and how the, that relationship might extend beyond just the urban environment. Um, before I get started into the dialectic, uh, a bit on the, geo, or the geography of Los Angeles, there are two major rivers that go through the Los Angeles basin. Um, that would be the Los Angeles River and the San Gabriel River. Each of these rivers has a massive um, watershed. The Los Angeles River extends into the San Fernando Valley uh, and millions of people live there and the San Gabriel River extends up into a national forest that gets some of the most intense rainstorms on the, in the state of California. Um, on average, each year, Los Angeles gets 37 and a quarter or so centimeters of rainfall per year, but there really are no average years in California. Um, 
there can be years where you get three times that much or a third of that much. And it really is subject on global climate systems. Um, so the first people that lived in the Los Angeles basin were the Tongva. And the Tongva saw the landscape as something that was really a whole um, that they were part of. Uh, there were thousands of people that lived in uh, Los Angeles, the LA basin and the surrounding valleys. Um, and the, the estimate is around 5,000, but that's what the, the Spanish missionaries saw. Um, there really could have been much, much more. Um, and the Tongva people lived within this landscape, but they also were a key actor for the maintaining the structure and changing how the ecosystems relate to one another across this ecological mosaic. Um, these indigenous peoples lived uh, through many different ecological relationships with the land. Uh, in the mountains, they harvested berries from the chaparral. Um, as they descended down the slopes, there were oak savannas that were really important to providing sustenance um, as acorns. And uh, down into the basin, there was a, a vast prairie where the peoples hunted antelope as well as uh, collected a, a myriad of medicines and foods. Um, and down in the rivers, they got a lot of their materials and, and uh, down into the seashores, they got a lot of uh, uh, oceanic marine resources from there. Um, in 1771, things began to change. The Spanish uh, empire arrived and within that first year, they had decided that a site right on the LA River, El Rio Porcincula, as they called it then, would be the site of a new uh, agricultural empire in, in California. Um, though it was very peripheral on the Spanish empire, uh, which it still relied on resources from Mexico City. Um, under the Spanish, indigenous people were marginalized and either forced into missions. There were two in the basin and a third down closer to Orange County um, or marginalized and pushed to the seashores where they could not be uh, controlled by the Spanish. Um, Indigenous people in the missions were forced to carve a canal from the, uh, the river to feed the, the growing population, both in the mission and in the city. And cattle were introduced, uh, which soon quickly expanded and blew up and a huge population soon lived across these valleys and the LA basin. Um, in 1821, the Spanish empire devolved and, or dissolved and the Me Mexicans began uh, controlling, but really they, they uh, uh, governed from afar. Los Angeles still remained at the periphery of, of empire. Um, in 1850, California joined uh, the United States of America, but even then Los Angeles remained quite peripheral for the first 20 years of uh, colonial American occupation. Uh, the first American rush into California was uh, focused on around gold, around Sacramento and San Francisco, and Los Angeles, located far south, uh, remained pretty peripheral, and though its cattle industry boomed, uh, and eventually, due to floods and drought, uh, perished, uh, Los Angeles remained at the edge of empire. In between 1876 and 1885, three different railroads connected to Los Angeles. And from there, the city really exploded. In 30 years, the population grew by 15 times. And that really began turning this, this Pueblo into a city, into a metropolis. Um, at the same time, people began talking about Los Angeles as something that it wasn't, as an Eden, as the cornucopia of the world, which really referred to the whole of California. But Los Angeles was really part of this. It was an agricultural city, and it really took off, focused on um, gardening and horticulture and the remaking of this, this uh, Mediterranean grassland and uh, valley and basins into a this Edenic vision that people began to equate with Los Angeles. This uh, brought a lot of exotic plants and tropical trees and people began seeing this as a tropical landscape that was purely something for people to improve rather than the actual uh, climate that was there. They began projecting a new landscape onto the pre-existing one. Uh, the other side of that was a booming citrus market and agribusiness that began in the LA basin and the valleys and floodplains around it. Um, between 1880 and 1890, a million uh, acres of orange fields had been planted, and this was really only the beginning. 
American capital had fueled the rise of this city from a pueblo into a growing burgeoning metropolis. And this was really just the beginning. As both the population and the agribusiness grew, the LA River was diverted again. First, it was diverted by a surface canal and then by underground pipes. And these underground pipes, as the city grew and doubled between 19 and population between 1900 and 1910, uh, the water sources that the city and the, the local ecology could provide proved uh, insufficient to reach the demands that people put on it. Uh, and by 1912, the river stopped flowing. It had became a dusty riverbank, uh, and it only flooded when it when rains really really picked up. That happened in 1938 when a big flood uh, destroyed many houses and uh, industrial districts in the south of Los Angeles, and that prompted the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to completely re-engineer the river and turn it into a flood control spillway. Though the goal of this spillway was to get water from the L.A. basin and the valleys surrounding it to the ocean as fast as possible to, you know, really prevent floods from happening. But at the same time, that really had deep significant impacts for the hydrology of the region. At the same time, between 1910 and 1930, we see the expansion of LA's hydrosocial hinterland, um, a connection to the Owens Valley up on the eastern side of the Sierras, as well as an extension to the Colorado River, really expanded and the, the amount of water that was available to Los Angeles as it grew. Um, these water sources became the lifeline for the continued growth of Los Angeles and really did it connect Los Angeles to the greater portions of the North American continent in a way that no other city really has. Uh, by 1970, California's Central Valley, or Central Valley project was completed and Los Angeles was integrated into that. And by that, in that way, Los Angeles's hinterland, the, the area by which water can come into the city just grew and grew and grew. Um, and that allowed a lot more water and a lot more growth um, between 1930 and 1970, most of the agricultural land in the LA was urbanized and completely paved over. The map I'm showing here shows impermeable land cover um, of today, and we can really see just how much um, urbanization has transformed the surface of the LA basin and its surrounding valleys. And that has really deep and important implications for the hydrology of the region, where water now just rushes into from the mountains uh, down into down the foothills and into these tributaries, which sole goal is to get the water out of the city as fast as possible. What this means is that water enters the city, but it leaves just as fast. And in an environment where rain is very stochastic and uh, intensity can be quite uh, critical, uh, this sort of water system it, is not sustainable in the long term. Um, in the same map, you can see this yellow pathway here, and that's one um, more liberal take on how we should be improving the LA River and bringing it back, and that's by adding parklands up on the north side of the river. But down south of uh, south of the de uh, of downtown, which occupies this little nook between the mountains here, uh, there are no parks along the river, and it really is a, a sewage treatment uh, effluent pathway out of the city um jordan yes i was just like you to know you have approximately two minutes yeah. left okay I'll, let me speed through um sure. so the land and the water really needs to be an important basis for the ecologization of politics um many people have advocated for the restoration of the la river um i'm going to skip a couple slides uh, and in the past in the 1920s frederick law olmsted a man who was really important in american uh landscape architecture recommended creating massive or large floodways, but this was not uh, along the river and that, that wasn't really done. Uh, at the same time in the past, Los Angeles had one of the most comprehensive and wide reaching rail networks. Um, but as the city and its highways expanded and blew up, uh, those were paved over. And now we have the city today where water runs out of the city and we can't keep it on the landscape. Um, my case for how, how we should be dealing with this is restoring the, the floodways as one NGO the, ha, has recommended, but at the same time, we need soil to be brought back all over the surface of the city. 
Uh, in order to bring back the LA River, we need water to be penetrating the earth and we need it to be coming back into our rivers. And that can be only begin by changing the way we relate to the landscape through both soil and food and water. We need to be bringing food for us through the city um, in a way that allows us to use native plants, the oak trees and the black walnuts and the toyon berries. We need to be bringing those back onto the landscape in a way that allows us to change the way we relate to the water and the soil and the land and our communities. Um, so I'll end up with there. Um, how do we get to this better future? Uh, that, that's, that's the question. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jordan, for this uh, inspiring talk. Uh, we've seen with you how yeah, urban planning, as much as technology, which we've seen previously, can be put back to the service of the environment through different priorities. And right now, we will therefore welcome Laura to talk uh, to talk about animals, 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 right, and free nature, and what it implies for uh, uh, for animals and uh, these forms of domination. So. Laura, you now have the, the word and uh, yeah, you have the floor. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is uh, my PowerPoint appearing on the screen? Mm, right now, yes. Right now it, it's, uh, it's appearing. Right. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, so yes, uh, my name is Laura Schleifer. Um, and I am actually going to be talking today. I'm the Total Liberation Campaign Director of the Institute for Critical Animal Studies. Um, so I really focus in my work on uh, connecting the issue of the human domination over other animals to issues of human liberation and ecology. And so I um, felt that uh, I needed to connect that issue to the broader issue of social ecology. So I'm gonna be talking about that today um, and how uh, the human domination over other animals relates to the human domination over other humans and also over nature more generally. Um, okay, let me just make sure I'm, hold on. Okay, sorry about that. So um, the name of my talk, Hierarchies Hidden Link, How Domination Within Human Society and of Nature Stems from the Human Domination of Other Animals and How Free Nature Requires Freeing Animals. So um, social ecology was an idea that was both ahead of its time and a throwback to an earlier era. Um, so, Bookchin's idea of social ecology um, in large part was rooted by a quote I'll start with from him. The domination of nature by man stems from the domination of human by human. And with that declaration, uh, Bookchin stated a foundational tenet of his theory of social ecology, which is that it was hierarchy within human society that led to human domination over the rest of nature. And at the time and place when Bookchin's magnum opus, The Ecology of Freedom, was published, this idea stood against the current strain of thought. Appearing just 12 years after Earth Day launched the modern U.S. environmental movement in 1970, Bookchin's thesis starkly contrasted the neo-Malthusianism that was sweeping across the U.S. at that time and heralding the bleak advent of neoliberalism. So two decades earlier, uh, the student revolts had commenced with a clear anti-capitalist bent sparked by the uh, Frankfurt School scholar Herbert Marcuse's influential work, One Dimensional Man, which warned of capitalist evils beyond labor exploitation, such as the psychological and ecological impacts of consumerism in all sectors of society and the earth itself. Um, but that was being eroded 
at the time when Bookchin published The Ecology of Freedom. Um, so these are two books that were um, really popular at that time, and they were really kind of shifting the narrative away from this idea of the ecological problems being rooted in the social problems and specifically capitalism um, and shifting away from that and kind of putting the blame on uh, the sort of conceptions of human nature that were um, projecting these very sort of Hobbesian views of human nature as being inherently greedy and corrupt and all of this, and also um, this idea of overpopulation. So uh, The Population Bomb and The Tragedy of the Commons were two books that were kind of um, pushing along this narrative that, that went along with neoliberalism and kind of reinforced it as uh, being the right way. So because of that, this whole idea of the ecological problems being rooted in social problems was really eroded during that period. And um, this has only changed very, very recently. And there's still some work to do on that. But um, more recently, there is more of a concept that uh, Bookchin was right, that the ecological problems stem from inequality and systems of domination within human society. So you can see from some recent uh, actions from the climate justice movement, um, climate change affects us the most, showing um, people of color, showing colonized people, showing marginalized people as being the ones who are the most impacted by the ecological issues, uh, which are being caused by the colonialist, imperialist, industrialized capitalist world. Um, you can see climate justice, racial justice, that there is a connection there. There's a growing awareness of that. You can see indigenous people's movements rising up. Um, so there is a growing awareness of this, but for a very long time, of course, uh, the ecological issues were not framed in those terms in capitalist industrialized societies. They were framed in much more individualistic terms and Bookchin really sought to uh, challenge that. And that was extremely important. And he was right about a lot of things uh, where that was concerned. And that was very natural for him to uh, think of ecological problems as social problems because of his background as a Marxist and his um, already uh, mind was primed for looking at things through um, the lens of human systems of domination and exploitation and capitalism, first as a Marxist and then as an anarchist later on. So he was really um, right about a lot of things. However, while his theories about the interrelationship between a hierarchy within human society and human domination over nature are astonishingly insightful, he drastically overlooked the role that the human domination over other animals has played in the formation and continuing reinforcement of human oppression and in the human domination over nature. So to Bookchin, hierarchy began within human society and then extended into nature. But a lot of historical research has indicated that it was and still is a far more mutually reinforcing process than Bookchin recognized. So just as he rightly ascertained that inequality and power differentials within human society have shaped human attitudes and practices towards other life forms, so too has the human domination of other life forms shaped human attitudes and practices towards fellow humans and towards nature overall. So to really get a holistic social ecological approach, um, you really have to combine these two narratives and integrate them. So, how the human oppression of other animals led to the human oppression of other humans. Uh, so basically to integrate these two stories about the emergence of hierarchy requires examining prehistory and the Neolithic agrarian revolution. So the general consensus 
there is some challenge to this is that during the Paleolithic era, um, basically the society was quite egalitarian. Um, so some of the traits of the forager societies, uh, these were the gatherer hunter societies, um, they were on the move constantly. So they had no concept of ownership of other humans or other animals or land and nature. Um, they were believed to be more egalitarian, although there is some um, difference of opinion on this, but uh, I would say that most anthropologists believe that. Um, cisgender women or uterus havers uh, were highly regarded for their ability to produce children, whereas cisgender men may have been unclear about their role in procreation, and as a result, uh, had an inferiority complex about their lack of ability to bear children. Uh, the main daily food source at that time was gathering or foraging. Um, so hunting was really kind of a special, rare occasion thing. It was not the daily food supply. It was a, it was a big um, event. But a cult of sorts developed around the hunting of large animals. Hunting became very tied up with masculine identity as men who could not bear children needed to compensate for that lack and prove that they had value. Now, Bookchin also talks about this issue of uh, needing to prove that they had value. Um, in the Ecology of Freedom, he talks about elderly people needing to do that, um, especially when there was some sort of food shortage or hardship, um, and, and they could be seen as a burden uh, because they couldn't share the workload as much as other members of the community. And so that's how they ended up um, convincing people that they were shamans and that they had a special connection to the spirit world to prove their value. And that really kind of led to the development of organized religion. So there's much in Bookchin's analysis about the emergence of hierarchy that does make sense. However, it does not account for the brutal and specifically sex-based forms of violence with which women and men uh, began to be subjugated during this period. Nor does it describe the development of human attitudes of ownership over other humans and their subsequent enslavement. So for that, you really do need to consider uh, more specifically, the role of the human domination of other animals and how that influenced how humans started treating other humans. So you had three different lifestyles emerging during this period, uh, foragers, herders, and farmers. And of course, uh, Bookchin would agree that this was the era of the origins of institutionalized hierarchy and what he called second nature, which is the human society and, of course, um, the, the hierarchical society. So these three different lifestyles emerged, roaming foragers, sedentary agrarian planters and farmers, and roaming herders, um, or otherwise known as pastoralists. The pastoralists slash herders were in many ways a combination between the farmer and the forager lifestyle. And while the foragers continued their non-materialistic way of life, both the herders and the farmers began to develop attitudes of acquisition and a growing concept of human manipulation of nature in order to achieve desired results. So of course the farmers were manipulating the land to produce plant foods and the herders started to control and manipulate wild herds of animals and um, attach themselves to them and eventually completely dominate and control them. Big difference though, um, planters continue to have reverence for nature in many ways due to the bounty of fura land, whereas herders emerged in sparse, desolate landscapes that shaped their attitudes of domination over other animals and ultimately over other humans, their warlike attitudes towards nature because nature was not their friend, nature was harsh and their conception of fearsome gods. Again, this fearsome God that was very harsh and punishing because they came from these harsh and punishing landscapes of the desert and the European steppes. So 
the herders um, actually became invaders and then they became warlord kings and then they became the eventual landed aristocracy in feudalism. So the herders developed ownership attitudes towards the herds of animals they attached themselves to and eventually controlled. Um, they were warlike in part because they were constantly needing new land for grazing and watering animals. So this really uh, drove colonialism and it still drives colonialism and imperialism very much today. This constant need for when you do animal agriculture, you need lots of fresh land um, and water supply. And so you're constantly uh, seeking more of it. They became right. paranoid because they were constantly moving and yet they had to guard their, their possessions from would-be raiders, which of course were the animals. They had to stop their animals from running away, which fostered tendencies towards controlling others, human and non-human alike. They had to develop techniques to break the rebellious spirits of animals and make them docile and compliant, which were then used on the human populations that they invaded. Uh, they controlled animal reproduction, which gave them ideas about controlling human reproduction. And they had, again, this constant need for grazing land and water. And so because of that, they started invading the farmer societies. So when you hear these really notorious names in history, like Genghis Khan and Attila the Hun that would come in and they would slaughter all these people and take over the land and enslave the people and all the rest of it, um, they pretty much as a general rule, always come from the herder societies. Sorry, Laura, I just would yeah. like to let you know that you have a couple more minutes to, to finish before we go to discussion. Okay, so um, this really led to the origins of feudalism. And one of the things that uh, they used were, um, they used animals as weapons of war which was a very powerful way to go in and invade. And then of course they could leave, you know, very quickly, nobody could catch them because they were on horseback. Um, so that actually really became a part of their militarism. Um, when the herders or the warriors uh, invaded the planter societies, the planter society men were enslaved, uh, very often castrated. Um, or they were killed because they pre presented a threat. And the women and children were abducted and enslaved. Um, and this became more of a thing that they would enslave the men rather than kill them. Same thing with the animals, male animals. Originally, they would just kill them all except for the stud male that would impregnate the females. Um, but aside from that, they would, um, they would kill them, but they started realizing that they could enslave them and they could get something out of them. So it really kind of fostered this uh, instrumentalist way of looking at both humans and non-human animals. And the castration, of course, was done to both humans and non-human animals. And uh, that's where the whole tradition of eunuchs came from. So you can see beating animals into submission, beating humans into submission, using the tools that they created to subjugate animals on humans. Um, branding, right? Brand the animals, brand the humans, brand the enslaved humans. And in ancient Rome, you can see beating the animals, beating the humans, enslaved humans. This is a collar. They would actually put a collar around a human to indicate ownership and to control them, just like a non-human animal. So when the Enlightenment came along, uh, this brought new discoveries about non-human animal sentience, and it really raised the question of what separates humans from other animals. And um, this had a lot of different factors as to why this question was happening. Um, but a really big one was a combination of they realized through uh, experiments that they were doing that non-human animals were actually very much like humans. They could feel, they could, um, you know, they had the same sensations and even emotions. And so because of that, they had to separate that. They had to make that separation between the human and the animal because if they didn't, uh, then it would be unjustifiable by Christian morality and later by liberal values to treat other animals this way. And so they started to come up with this construct 
of what differentiates a human from an animal. And what they started doing with that construct is they started actually using that against the humans that they colonized. And they would say, well, um, those people are more like animals. And therefore, we don't have to treat them like humans. We can treat them the way that we treat animals. So some of the traits, um, they really started kind of saying, well, physicality is more animalistic, the physical. The emotional is more animalistic. Um, these, and this fetishization of reason um, and rationality during that period actually uh, came from that. It was this idea of, well, you know, if animals have emotions and if animals have um, the same physical pain sensations, then we must be different because we have reason. And colonized people, they're more like animals. They don't have reason. They're physical brutes. They're emotional. They don't have self-control um, like we Europeans do, et cetera. And they really weaponize this construct of the animal against the people that they colonized. So, Laura, so if you yeah. wrap up soon, we will be moving to right. this question soon. Yeah, just to remind, it's okay. Okay, so I'm just going to wrap it up by saying that basically this is a long history. I'm going to skip ahead, actually, and we're going to take a quick look at just some of the modern day um, things, the ways that this is still being used even today. Um, so you can see horrifying usage of this construct of the animal even now, right? Um, racism, it's like we're seen as animals, um, black men, black people, um, and that that is used then to, as an excuse to subjugate them as a rationalization. Trump, our favorite president, <laughs> uh, speaking about immigrants, these aren't people, these are animals. He knows that the weaponization of animality can be used to then deny people their rights. Um, disgusting image of something that just happened very recently in the US. Uh, you see Haitian refugees trying to come over the um, so-called border into the so-called US. Um, and you see the, um, here of course is the border patrol you know, colonial agent, and he's number one on a horse, so still using animals as weapons themselves. So dominating animals in order to dominate, to use them to dominate other humans, right? He's got a whip used, of course, to dominate animals, to um, beat animals into submission, using that against humans. So you can see still these, these uh, tendencies very, very alive even today. Um, children in cages. This is again at the US so-called border. Um, they're like animals, right? Quote unquote, they have to be caged like animals. So this same construct being used even now. Um, many different ways in which uh, the subjugation of animals is intertwined with the subjugation of humans. Here we have slaughterhouse workers in the US. Um, many of them are undocumented immigrants. They have no other option for other jobs. Many are uh, current convicts that are literally enslaved um, or ex-convicts that can't get another job or just very, very poor people with no other options. And, you know, when you subjugate animals, it requires this human underclass to do the work of that, to do that dirty work, because of course, nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to spend their days killing living beings all day, every day. Um, so a few final words yes, on Laura, this. So, yeah. To move to the discussion soon. Okay. If you have a few concluding sentences, it would be great, but then we can discuss all those themes during the discussion also. It's it right. more interesting. Right, right. So um, basically a few just uh, ways that the human domination of other animals uh, continues to intertwine with the domination of other humans. Um, so it creates and maintains the tools and techniques used to dominate and control other animals which are then used against humans. Um, it creates and reinforces the rationale 
for subjugating other humans by framing them as animals. And then it becomes quote unquote justifiable to treat them that way because they're just animals. Um, it drives the need to subjugate or exterminate fellow humans due to this constant need for land, for grazing, for water, um, again, to have an underclass to do the dirty work of controlling and killing the animals. Um, you can even see that in the um, original colonial conflict in the United States, cowboys versus First Nations people. Cowboys, of course, because it was for the cows, <laughs> to, to ranch the cows and graze the cows, that they needed all that land. Um, animals themselves being used as a tool of war and as a tool for subjugating other humans, as we saw with the Haitian refugees. Um, environmental racism, classism, et cetera, because there are huge ecological impacts and toxins coming out of um, the animal agriculture industries. Actually, 17,900 people in the US died last year just from uh, fecal matter in the air from animal agriculture. Um, and it forces people, and particularly men, to disconnect emotionally in order to be able to commit acts of violence against other thinking, feeling, and conscious individuals. Uh, historically, of course, that started with um, non-human animals, but then it became against other humans in war and other uh, forms of human subjugation of other humans. So um, that's it. And basically, um, I just think that social ecology is not going to be complete um, unless we take this issue into serious consideration and unless we look at liberation as a total liberation where it's going to require liberating humans, liberating, yes, the natural ecosystems, but also, of course, liberating other species of animals. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lara, for this presentation. So we are running a bit late, but we will have a, obviously the discussion period. So really, anyone we need to to intervene orally through the Zoom is more than welcome to to do so. Obviously, we will have also the questions to the chat and questions to YouTube. So uh, would anyone like to to ask a question to our panelists? If there's no question on the uh, on the Zoom. There is one question from. Uh, we have uh, Johannes. Johannes, you raised your hand. Would you like to ask a question? Yeah, I have a question for Giannis. Um, and I was just curious about what you see as the role of um, technology as Bookchin uh, explores it in Ecology of Freedom, where he describes technology as essentially ambivalent in its root, but its uh, you know implementation being the cause of. Um, harm, especially when he talks about techne versus technics. I don't know if you've had any experience of that in your research, but I was wondering what your perspective on that might be. We have no audio for you right now. Nice. Oh, sorry, sorry. My microphone went off. Um, I didn't hear the question well. If you could repeat it again. Please. Yeah, it, yeah. Just kind of in short, kind of, uh, what your thoughts are on Bookchin's idea of technics and techne from uh, the ecology of freedom, um, and his his position there that technology is essentially ambivalent in its pure form or before its implementation, and that it's the utilization of technology that becomes unethical or causes harm. Okay, so uh, um, I haven't I haven't uh, seen I haven't read this book so I don't want to 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 say something misleading um, except if you have heard, read this article they uh, they liberal technology and if it is some common ideas with his book it would be perfect okay um, I see there is uh, one question uh, on zoom from Emmet for Laura. So mm -hmm. is there a reason to say gatherer first instead of hunter? Yes. Uh, so actually the reason why is because the 
Um, primary food source uh, in the Paleolithic era actually came more from gathering than hunting ultimately. And so because of that, there are eco-feminists that have challenged this idea of putting hunting first because it kind of prioritizes the male or masculine role of hunting and kind of shines the spotlight on it and gives it more um, prominence than it really had in the overall food source uh, at that time, and it minimizes the role of women or the feminine. Thank you very much, Lara. Um, next question comes from uh, YouTube. Um, I think it's more directing towards Yanis. Says, uh, so Fantuki says, very interesting. What about the user's right of these technological achievements? We see such problems with the digital and social media technology where there are big limitations in citizens' freedom. Yes, so I, I read this uh, question when I end my presentation. Um, I don't want to I don't want to late this uh, conference. Uh, it, it is a very huge issue what uh, our friend uh, is asking, but it's not for Finberg, at least it's not just uh, a matter of, of rights. Let's say I have the right to a specific technological innovation, let's say, but it's a, a, an appropriation of the of technology from the users and it takes place in time. It's not just that someone has the right to a technology, that might be that uh, only the corporation that created it has the right to it. But it's a it's a huge process, an enormous process of appropriating this technology from the users, from the society, and reappropriating, redesigning it um, through its uh, use. So um, oh, it's, it, it is sure that I can't uh, answer this question right now in completed form. But it's not just for Finberg's theory. It's not just a matter of just who has the rights of it. And for the digital and social media technology, um, it is something that Finberg uh, is uh, currently working on. His latest book um, tries to answer such questions about the digital form. And um, so I don't, I wouldn't want to answer something uh, right now about this. There are lots of, uh, of articles of his or his uh, inner circle, let's say, um, and we we are currently um, seeing what is going on the, with the digital technologies around the world. Thank you, Yanis, for this uh, answer. We now have a question from Max uh, for Laura uh, that says, Laura, can you talk more about social ecology and anti-species praxis? How do you envision integrating animal liberation into the communalist project? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's such a natural fit between social ecology and animal liberation, because, uh, first of all, you know, I would say that a big part of social ecology is going to be rewilding a lot of land. Um, and uh, that would very much fit with um, not consuming animals. <laughs> so, um, you know, that actually is one of the main reasons that I really do promote the idea of um, veganism for especially industrialized societies, because that's a way to free up a, a massive amount of land. Um, in fact, actually, if uh, everyone stopped eating animals, we would free up a land mass the size of the entire United States and Australia and the entire EU and China combined. <laughs> so we're talking massive, massive amounts of land, um, which then of course could be rewilded. You know, that would make the ecology flourish. Um, and it would also lead to human flourishing as well. And, you know, especially like indigenous societies and, you know, so definitely that. Um, I think also there is the idea of communalism with animal sanctuaries. So for, let's say some of the species that, um, you know, are, have historically been used in ways that have been invasive um, and that also are individually uh, 
as it stands now, not able to, um, or would have a hard time anyway, surviving in the wild. Um, this works perfectly, right? The community um, with the animal sanctuary, and of course, animals, the interdependence of social ecology is that we would still be getting the um, benefits of let's say regenerative grazing and um, fertilizer and all that sort of stuff for our own gardens and our own um, flourishing plant food production, but in a way that would truly be interdependent and holistic and ecological and not based on domination. So I think there really is a lot um, that very much could be uh, in alignment, very much so. In fact, I, I almost feel like it would be hard to, to not have them in alignment. It, it just makes, Bookchin once said that his favorite word is coherence. And I think that a coherent approach to social ecology is to integrate animal liberation into it. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, we have now one last question. And after the, the answer, we'll move on to the next panel. So this question is directed to uh, Yanis. So the idea and reality of technology being owned should have been highlighted. Uh, is technology free floating or technically shaped by ownership relations and serving specific end of capital accumulation? And uh, again, I will say that um, Greenberg's theory um, focuses on how uh, people uh, can uh, affect technology rather than, uh, let's say, the corporations that fund it. Or, of course, technology is being uh, owned for, from some, but um, he turns, as I said to my presentation to Foucault and Michel Desertot, that um, technology and the specific regime of truth that this um, paradigm is established establishes um, construct uh, the subjectivity of uh, of human of humans and uh, there needs to be a way uh, that we we can affect the the, more, the shape of our subjectivity so his his theory is turned to, to that point. That's why he he's contrasted to determinism and the other uh, philosophies of technology like that of Heidegger's or uh, Jacques Ellis or and more. So of course technology is, is owned and is uh, serving specific ends, but the whole story with the technical code and the participant interest and stuff is contrasted to all of this trying to uh, to find an alternative um, so that, that we can do something, that our subjectivity is not just um, um, shaped from others, from the from whoever owns the technology, something like that. Thank you, Yanis. So two questions have uh, emerged at the last minute for Jordan, so we will take them and uh, Jordan, you will uh, yeah, close this, uh, this panel with those questions. So the first question is the following. What is the awareness of Los Angeles citizens on water provision? Uh, do they see it as a boom or of nature, boon of nature, or are more sensitized that it is a valuable and rare resource? So that would be the first question for you. The second question is, uh, Jordan, I am sorry that I missed your talk. What sort of social, social ecological vision do you think Bookshin would have for Los Angeles? What are your own thoughts for a social ecological future for a sentence? Those are both great questions. Um, from the, uh, the perspective of someone who you know, interacts with a lot of students, I don't interact with a ton of people outside the UCLA community, though I, I am uh, still participating in that. Um, most people are kind of unaware about the sheer magnitude of the size of the hydrosocial hinterland of Los Angeles. Um, I see a lot of people, you know, you're leaving a tap on, we got fountains going on, like, there definitely is a big consciousness and the awareness of drought in Los Angeles and California broadly, though, people tend to see water as something that's just, you know, freely available due to these huge, like engineering systems that we have that are designed and implemented to make water super convenient and readily available to people when they need it. 
but aren't designed to make sure that that water is being ecologically used and efficiently used, especially as it relates to irrigation of all of the, you know, the big urban forest that is developed here um, in the last 100 years. Um, people are especially aware of the droughts, though. The threats of flooding is, is pretty lost on people because so many of the events are just, you know, past people's um, experience. People are people, they, they don't happen super often, though when they happen, they are big. Um, I think Bookchin would have had a similar uh, understanding as I do that we need radical change in order to turn Los Angeles into an ecological city. Um, it's really totalizing the urbanization that has spread across this area and pavement and these big brutalist buildings that just really kind of take away a sense of place and a sense of belonging and a sense of community from the city. Um, Personally, I think that this city has been designed around cars and that's a huge issue when, you know, maybe a quarter of the city's surface area is de like dedicated to roads and parking lots and these things that if cars weren't the mode of transportation we were relying on, we could replace with, you know, more bike paths and road, like dirt and area for trees and habitat to come back. Um, and that kind of a vision for Los Angeles, sadly, is not that like it's not on the table for the ecological politics that are happening here in Los Angeles. Um, there is a big focus on the rebirth of the LA River and the re, uh, revegetation of that um, really, uh, people see it as a park and an opportunity to bring green space into the city, though without uh, more broad changes, the LA River will remain dead and water will not be flowing down its banks. Um, so really, in order to restore life to the LA River, which people really do want to do, it's going to take a lot more um, staunch ecological politics and radical radical decision making in order to bring that into reality. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you very much to uh, our three speakers. It was a fascinating talk and a fascinating talks and a fascinating discussion. Thank you very much. So obviously, as you know, the next panel also deals with nature and ecology. So we will have the occasion to, to deepen a bit our discussion about uh, those thematics. So um, I would like to welcome Emmet, Johannes, and Anita, who will be our speakers for this uh, panel. So Emmet will be presenting about the connection between misanthropy and ecofascism. Um, Johannes about the COVID as a phenomenon of disease. And finally, Anita will be uh, talking to us about the role of direct democracy uh, in the, the search for restoration in, in troubled times in the Indian context. So uh, also fascinating topics. And uh, I now invite Emmet to, to start this panel. As a reminder, uh, it would be an, uh, ideal if all the speakers could maintain a time of about 15 minutes. I can uh, give a little reminder a bit before for wrapping up and we will that week have a longer discussion later. Mm -hmm. So Emmet, you can now uh, start this panel. Uh, you have the floor, thank you. I thank you very much for inviting me um, for this panel. Uh, also, thank you very much for the organizers. Uh, you have linked every topic very um, wisely between each other. Um, now I'm going to talk about misanthropy and ecofascism connection. But before that, uh, we, I'm the co-author of this book. Uh, this book came out um, from the previous uh, Trisa conference, um, Social Ecology and the Right to the City from Black Rose, good company. If you don't have this book, um, I really recommend about city ecology and um, right to the city, um, many aspects from many perspectives. So my topic is misanthropy and ecofascism connection. Um, I'm an la uh, edible landscape designer and implementer um, about 15 years. Uh, I'm closely linked to uh, Laura's saying, I'm not an uh, animal liberation activist, but I'm eco-feminist at the same time, uh, as well as social ecologist uh, long-term. Um, 
since coronavirus lockdowns in 2019, biocentrism found more ground. While Anthropocene on the table, uh, people started to express their uh, concerns more often like humans are cancer on this planet. Now climate emergency also <clears throat> became um, our main focus under the Green New Deal in the US and Green Reconciliation in Europe. We know from the history, Europeans spread it colonization all over the world. I argue that authoritarianism has been increasing. <clears throat> Thus, misanthropy and latent ecofascism is becoming more visible. Instead of diving into deep ecology during my presentation, um, uh, which has close connection with biocentrism, I will try to uh, foresee whether climate emergency policies may restore the earth uh, or uh, what we can do as radical social ecologists. First um, subtopic is our humans virus on this planet. During COVID-19 lockdowns, some people started to emphasize their biocentric perception via sharing wildlife images those appeared in the cities. In this way, instead of advocating for humans freedom, they were supporting human imprisonment. Their motto was, nature is healing, we are the virus. At the same time, increasing number of people from day to day, they are uh, losing trust to uh, the, some humans, uh, to the institutions and the governments. Uh, and they often say, I invest for animals, not for the humans from now on. Whereas people who see humans as cancer, cancerous organisms on this planet, they are blind to see a real picture. Capitalism is started to destroy all living beings and its activity accelerated in last 50 years, according to Anthropocene researchers. Scientific American underlines only 7% of carbon emission is reduced in 2020 due to the lockdowns. At the same time, for example, meat consumption is increased, which is one of the six climate change mitigation. As we know that industrial farming is also another cause of pandemics due to de deforestation, deforestation and biodiversity loss. An ecological model, modeler, Kay Jones at the University College of London underlines this analysis of, uh, of around 6,800 ecological communities on six continents adds to a growing body of evidence that concerns trends in human development and biodiversity loss to disease outbreaks she also expresses might disease outbreaks might, might occur again and again. In, in addition to that, prioritization of human health over environmental health also caused, caused uh, long-term damage to, to the earth. For example, toxic waste is increased tons of tons uh, and now mostly trying to be sold to the developing countries, including my home country to Turkey. It's an issue <clears throat> here. A UN report emphasizes uh, developing countries have a big stake uh, in the global plastics economy. Their share of global plastics production jumped from 43 0.5% in 2009 to 58% um, in 2018. And two out of three plastics manufacturing jobs are in the global south. 
I suspect this amount is increased hundreds of times uh, <clears throat> post COVID-19 period. Now, biocentrism have a link to misanthropy and latent ecofascism as a subtopic. Misanthropy is a Greek word, and also it is a philosophical concept. Misos means dislike and, or hate, and anthropos means human. It's the thought that suggests humans have evolved incorrectly. We may summarize uh, this into three categories. First, humankind is destructive. Second, humankind is cruel. Third, humankind always make mistakes and never learn from mistakes. According to these three categories, human nature is inherently insatiable greedy, destructive, selfish, wasteful, dogmatic, and so on. When we imagine a community with these values, of course, it requires parochialism, which is considered other humans who are not from their own land or their own blood. They are outsider, and even they may be potential animals, uh, enemy, sorry. And they are a threat to them. Peter Steinmeier and Janet Beale's uh, book, uh, Ecofascism Revisited, include natural mysticism in 19th century Germany. They trace the ways na Nazi ecologists made organic farming, vegetarianism, nature worship. These were related themes foundational to the Nazi ideologies of blood and soil and also homeland. Now we are in Anthropocene age, as I have um, underlined uh, at the beginning. Misanthropy may reflect to global South and to their people who live in developed countries as a labor force more than before. At the same time, indigenous people, black people, and people of color overall may face more misjudgments, uh, such as uneducated, overpopulated, dirty, lazy, not consuming organics. Uh, they don't know even organics or, or, uh, and so on. These sorts of misjudgments is already ca causing some violent attacks. For instance, a mass murder attack has happened uh, to the Muslim community in Christchurch in Aotearoa, New Zealand in 2019 by a white racist, Brandon Tarrant. His manifesto was cited as inspiration of Al Gore's The Inconvenient Truth and a Sustainable Population which means carrying capacity overloads when the outsiders arrive to a country. In other words, the people create anomaly in a <clears throat> dominant homogeneous culture. It's obvious that ecofascism marries <clears throat> with white supremacy through environmentalism. This source of biocentric perception has a relationship with ecofascism. They may want to protect cultural and religious homogeneity under the hidden environmental values and the policies. Sustainable population is one of them. Although migrants and refugees do mostly unwanted and underpaid jobs in developed countries, they mostly seen as the straw that broke the camel's back. Whereas they need to see the reality, uh, how climate change is becoming a deadly part of white na na nationalism. A 2019 analysis by the Climate Accountability Institute found that just 20 fossil fuel companies, including Chevron, Exxon, uh, and BP are responsible for over a third of world's carbon emissions since uh, 1965. 
powerful uh, agro corporations are driving deforestation deforestation in the Amazon by raising cattle for slaughter. Another point is that according to a World Bank report this year, in 2021, 216 million climate refugees are predicted by 2050, unless urgent action is taken. Therefore, I believe that this issue is required more attention. Now I'm approaching to the conclusion. Of course, there are some level of negativity biases at every human under the scarcity, scarcity mentality, which is created by global capitalism today. For us social ecologists, we know that our guideline, prin, uh, guideline social principle is natural dialectic as Jordan has uh, emphasized this very nicely. Because in, in a natural ecosystems, if I borrow from Bookchin, um, unity in complexity, uh, he says, brings a social and environmental resiliency. I observe this in ecosystems, edible ecosystems, especially wild ecosystems in wilderness quite often. If we think as human, <clears throat> as a thought producing po political animal, the essence is based on the mutuality. As Peter, Peter uh, Kropotkin developed mutual aid theory, um, in early uh, 19th century, every human being need each other, support mutually, like the plant communities do that. <clears throat> they don't obstruct each other's sun, water, and minerals. Instead, they support <clears throat> each other through the root system to protect each other from the disease, for example. However, as a living organisms, all this depends on the environmental and social conditions for humans and other living beings as well. I believe that everything constructs socially. Uh, also, a gender neut neutral language is necessary to overcome patriarchal culture, which brings domination over nature as well, not only over. <clears throat> uh, woman or other genders. I suggest that- I just wanted to let you know, you have a couple more minutes. Okay, finishing. I suggest to use humankind instead of mankind, but I believe this is not enough because every living organism uh, such as animals and plants are a part of the uh, any ecosystems. That's why better to adopt the word living kind. Living kind is a, <clears throat> is a, a gender uh, neutral um, ecological term, in my opinion. Since eco ecocide is a crime, the ecocide researchers argue this is a symptom of ever, ever growing demand from consumer associated uh, with capitalism. According to a World Bank report this year in 2021, uh, 2000, uh, 216 million climate refugees are predicted uh, uh, by 2050, I, I have already said that. Now the government policies are adjusted according to the climate emergency. However, we need to be careful how these policies may feed misanthropy and latent ecofascism. We need to develop our own <clears throat> justice based on environmental activism and climate justice. Uh, this is not only Anthropocene age, it's also a restoration age. We need to find our own way of community-based radical mm, politics. Thank you. Thank you very much, Demet, for this very interesting talk.
Um, and I would like to give the floor to Johannes, talking uh, to us about the COVID-19 as a larger phenomenon for disease. So Johannes, you now have the floor. Hi, can everybody hear me? Yes, okay. perfect. Awesome. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, COVID-19 as a phenomenon of a larger issue, um, that being disease. And for the purposes of this conversation, we're going to talk about disease as akin to invasive species, um, both of which are instances where an organism or an entity interrupts the ecological functioning of another and has a potential for harm. In order to explore this uh, topic, I'm putting Bookchin in conversation with the thinker Timothy Morton, another eco-critical thinker um, who has come up with an idea of hyperobjects, an idea that I think the application of Bookchin's techne to um, poses some potential for a more developed techne. Um, so to begin working through this, uh, I'm going to offer a case study in a plant called Japanese knotweed that is an invasive species that's native to the part of the United States that I live in in the Northeast. Um, so this plant was in, imported for aesthetic reasons in the 1920s and since the mid 20th century has become massively distributed temporally and spatially in our part of the country. Um, it poses an existential threat to uh, members of the local ecosystem. It's taking land away from plants that could be using that land that are native, um, as well as denying food sources to other species within that ecosystem. Um, along with this uh, ecological threat. It also poses a social threat in the form of road accidents from uh, interrupted sight lines from the plant matter, inefficient agriculture, uh, destruction of land that could be used for farming and housing. So to deal with this invasive species, one of the only uh, real useful ways to, to address it is through the use of pesticides. And in this, we encounter our first paradox of technology. To use pesticides can cause immense harm in their own right in dealing with an invasive species. Thus, the technology can be seen as negative. The intervention is harmful, and the paradox is presented that to act is to further harm, and to remain inactive perpetuates harm that humanity has already uh, instigated. From Bookshin, we get some insight into this paradox of technology in Chapter 9 of The Ecology of Freedom where he states, we are deeply riven by a sense of promise about technical innovation on the one hand and by a thorough sense of disenchantment with its results on the other. He presents uh, as a solution techne, this idea of uh, a system of ethical techniques that addresses technology through the, the standards of social ecology. However, when we begin to explore uh, Morton's idea of hyperobjects, things that are massively distributed through space and time, and viscous in that they interact with us as much as we interact with them, we begin to see a, a lacking of um, a techne that's able to respond to these scales. So I hope to borrow from Morton his idea of hyperobjects to put into conversation with Bookchin in order to create a larger form of techne um, as we go through this idea. I hope to assert that rather than each being correct or incorrect, that they are complementary with one another and in or, and to do so uh, is to allow the work of Bookchin to continue into the 21st century um, in conversation with a thinker he didn't have access to and to address issues that there is no way he could have been aware of. So briefly to talk about these two thinkers, we should all be familiar with Bookchin, I think, um, his idea of so social ecology, uh, the way he talks about technology and species, particularly as humanity as the intellectual uh, evolution of animals or of the natural world. Um, along with his thought, I, I work from Timothy Morton's dark ecology, specifically his idea of hyperobjects in that hyperobjects are these entities that are greater than human perception, that are viscous, non-local, and temporal and spatially dispersed beyond human comprehension. From this and in, in returning to COVID-19, uh, the solution to the problem or a technology that might deal with the problem has come out in the form of vaccination. And there are rejections of this technology that can be argued from both Bookchin and Morton. So from Bookchin, we could see this as a continuation of a hierarchical power structure in which the technology is used to continue um, the existing social, economic, and, and racial power structures. In Morton, we see uh, a rejection of vaccination as being individualistic, um, not accepting of the idea of a non-self or a lack of self to interact with the hyperobject. And it 
misses his goal of uh, dissolution of false dualism, dualisms. Principally, Morton would see vaccination rather than being a solution to a social problem, instead be a continuation of screens of socialization. To fear the, the disease or the, the virus is to respond to social conditioning that already exists. So if we have this issue of hyper objects and we have this, this issue of the use of technology, we should be able to find some way to uh, reconcile these two issues. Um, I posit that the way to do such would be a hyper modification of the hyper object, an idea I will refer to from here as a hyper mod. The hyper mod would essentially be the intermediary between hyper objects and the object, so between a society and something like an invasive species or COVID-19 as the conduit of affecting change upon the hyper objects and thus a form of communication. Historically, we can see examples of these having always existed, whether through human uh, interaction with intentionality or through hyper objects bumping into one, one another. So the first of these examples I'm going to give is the saddle or the bridle or whatever means we want to talk about to control horses. Um, this is a technology that allows the hyper object of humanity, this large group that is massively distributed through space and time to interact with horses, this other large group that's uh, distributed through space and time in order to achieve the goals of each Humanity is able to tell the horse what it wants, and the horse responds to that um, command. Inversely, we have a hyper, a hyper mod in the form of a cat's meow. So kittens meow to their mother. Cats, feral cats particularly, don't meow at all. Uh, they don't use it as a form of communication. Thus, they form the hyper mod of meowing in interaction with humanity in order to let humans know what they want or what their desires are to affect the change that they desire to be to be affected. So now that we understand that these hypermods exist, have always existed and uh, present a potentiality to change these hyper objects that might otherwise be unchangeable features of uh, the human experience, we can reapply this to these two thinkers. Um, so Morton posits that the hyper object is unchangeable and he gives the example of three Georgian woodsmen who encounter a spent fuel container in uh, the forest during the winter, they uh, they huddle around it to gain warmth, to not freeze, and it uh, effectively kills them through radiation poisoning. And he gives this as an example of a hyper object that is being interacted with, but has no human intentionality behind it. I would argue against this point that this is merely an example of an unethical application of a hyper modification of the hyper object of radiation. Uh, there's a hu intentional human choice at some point to take the nuclear material and develop a set of technologies and techniques to use it to achieve productivist goals. Therefore, to take human intentionality out of the equation is to deny the reality of the use of the hyper object. Um, as such, these technologies, as Bookchin argues in The Ecology of Freedom, are essentially ambivalent the techniques of our time, however, have transformed them into being unethical through their implementation. He gives the example of the steam engine not being inherently an unethical technology, but instead being used to progress an existing um, method of containing workers to the factory. In that model, the techniques of the factory, the building that uses the technologies, is the unethical implementation rather than any one piece of revolutionary revolutionarily altering technology. Um, in Bookchin's model, Sekne in, in social ecology should be non-hierarchical, mutualistic, ecological, homeostatic, creative, self-determinative, and ensuring of a nascent freedom as derived by Chaya Heller. And as such, we can apply this to the techne of the hypermod that I am proposing. In keeping with all of Bookchin's ethical standards of social ecology that I just mentioned, the hypermod would do this work with the addition of a necessity of monitoring and forecasting of the impact of human-made hypermods, global trade, um, railroads, nuclear energy, solar energy, wind energy. We have uh, not, uh, not only an opportunity, but also a, a duty to monitor what the impact of these systems are and these technologies are, as well as forecast what new technologies might do to the environment. Along with this monitoring and intervene, uh, this monitoring and forecasting, 
there's a necessity to monitor and intervene in all cases of hypermods when they pose an existential threat to a species, ecosystem, non-human entity, or homeostasis in a given ecosystem, or they violate the ethical boundaries of any of Bookchin's ethical standards of social ecology. Seeing as humanity has made so many hypermods historically, and there are others that exist that pose existential threats to species, it is our duty as sentient beings and intellectual beings that can understand the impact to intervene should they uh, pose threats to one another. Um, thus, the hypermod exists now and has always existed. They are greatly caused by humans, and the idea of third nature of freedom requires humans to act to mitigate suffering caused by them. To return to my idea of COVID-19 as this phenomenon of disease more globally, like Japanese knotweed, as I introduced earlier, this is a human-induced hyperobject. We have spread COVID vastly throughout the world and time now um, through global trade, through travel, through political decisions, through the ways that we've dealt with it. We've created these hypermods like social distancing that have taken on lives of their own as new hyperobjects. Thus, we've already done this process. We must merely attend to it ethically as well. The net social benefit. A few, a few minutes to wrap up. Yeah. Yep, I got. It. Uh, therefore, the net social benefits of the vaccination must outweigh the net social harm. If we continue, the vaccination is not the same as the distribution of vaccines. Then this technology may be ethical, given the framework that I've provided above. The implementation of this hypermod requires the technique of hypermods from social ecology. To conclude. The hypermod addresses the hyperobjects in an ethical manner. It offers a solution other than an action to fundam fundamentally necessary issues. Um, and it allows us to interact with this process that's always been happening in a way that maintains an ethical status. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Johannes. Um, we'll now move on to the third talk of this, uh, this panel that will be given to us by Anita uh, with the title Restore Restoring Ecology in Troubled Times, Searching for the Role of Direct Democracy in the Indian Context. So Anita, if you're here, uh, you have the floor uh, for 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. It is my privilege to participate and share my thoughts with you. Uh, I have been introduced to social ecology recently, so there may be some mistakes and I hope that you will condone them. So uh, I would like to share my screen so that it becomes easier. I'm sorry. Yeah. So the topic is restoring ecology in troubled times. And uh, first of all, I would like to show you this map about the Gangetic Basin. Hope you can see it. And uh, uh, because that was the focus of my study, which I made earlier. And uh, this is uh, very uh, something very interesting and uh, 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 describing the fate of modern civilization. Uh, that how the modern civilization has brought about dead rivers and smoky uh, premises. And Anita, now, Anita, sorry. Yes, yeah, sorry to interrupt you. Is it, would it be possible to put a, a, a large view? There is a part of your screen that we don't see the part on the right. Okay. If uh, you could put, either put uh, the panorama or let's see. You can't see the screen? Uh, right now, there is uh, four, uh, three gray blocks in the middle, but maybe. Um, oh. Yes. Now well, so now, good. and now there is another one on the right. Uh, I don't know if you could put panorama, maybe be, uh, or a, a complete slideshow to make it uh, full screen. No. Ah, okay. Now no. it's better. Okay, okay. okay Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Now it's better. Sorry, sorry, sorry for that. No, no. Perfect. So, Thank you. Ecological restoration is defined as interdisciplinary field, or rather transdisciplinary field that promotes recuperation of 
damaged e ecosystem. We usually discuss environmental sustainability as an uncompromising deal in the context of climate crisis. This also needs to be applied in case of ecological restoration, more importantly in agrarian context, as it is completely transformed from natural to industrial and gaining it from life support. That is when we turn back from industrial to natural through sustainability transition would be contested in the future. Uh, the notion of transformation is gaining traction in contemporary sustainability debates. Whereas future of radical transformations towards sustainability cannot be predicted, it is suggested that scientists, policymakers, and practitioners need to consider such change in more inherently plural and political base. Probing emerging intersections between human geography and broader critical science interventions, the question of uncertainty has pervaded social and environmental problems. Some of these are endemic features of neoliberal transformation, health environment interactions, food security, or rather food insecurity, natural disasters, resource conflict, and global climate change. This paper uh, is an attempt. Uh, one minute. This paper is an attempt to understand the question of the impact of development and explore the possibility of ecological restoration through constructive engagement with impacted community in the context of time and place. In this process, the, we will imagine the possibility of community action in their own claim spaces through mitigating ne negative social and environmental impacts of sustainability transition. So now I turn to the colonial context. British uh, colonial rule conceived as a watershed in the ecological history of India in the Ganga Yamuna River Basin uh, was said to play its role as green imperialist. Actually, the entire issue of community control is intrinsically linked up with the development paradigm with primarily two aspects. Find, firstly, control over the resources Secondly, and more importantly, the role of indigenous knowledge in assisting the former. Since government is considered the most obvious agency for development, it is also considered to be the most appropriate agency for the control of natural resources, uh, which requires no validation or authorization of the local pop populace to appropriate these for their supposed vision of development. But this is not the right thing to do. Look at, at things in the Indian context. Uh, uh, we find that the colonialists uh, in India, they considered their knowledge superior and uh, dictated by political imperatives in an overall capitalistic framework. They, their visualization of natural resources as commodity led to the erosion of climate resilient traditional knowledge base uh, based on the optimum utilization of common property resources. The colonial rule caused serious disruption in the sustainable pattern of regional agro system, ecosystem, and the relations of production. What has been described as a, uh, as, uh, as a uh, transformation of agriculture actually uh, actually had a uh, long-standing impact on the ecological landscape. The departure started with the expansion of ag agriculture through clearing of pastures, decimation of jungles, reclamation of forest lands, and more importantly, the commercial exploitation of agriculture under colonial rule. The mainstay of colonial policy was augmentation of land revenue through agrarian expansion. And for this, the common lands were the first and worst targets. The pastures and fellow land virtually disappeared under the onslaught of colonial commercialization. Simultaneously, another process of expansion of marketable cash crops in plains, primarily wheat, opium, indigo, sugar, cotton, cane, these were pushed up vigorously. For this, a system of canals was designed for irrigation and turning common lands into productive agriculture. Water was an important common property resource and well irrigation, an important 
part of an indigenous agrarian system where irrigation was carried out by deploying knowledge of the landscape and water flow gained through experience. However, under colonial influence, water was diverted from its role in subsistence economy and transformed into a source of revenue or as an input to commodity, commodity production for the generation of profits. The indigenous irrigation system evolved through centuries of experience and incorporating local knowledge of the natural flow and geographical contours of a region was bypassed. The advent of colonial rule led to what is called as the commodification of water. Canal irrigation was given precedence and the irrigation knowledge of previous generations was thus lost it irretrievably. The canal irrigation also took, it, took its own environmental toll in the form of salinity, water logging and over exhaustion of land due to over farming. While commercialization of land and agriculture threatened the existence of pastoralists and agriculturists, the control of over forest put pressure on forest dwellers. From times immemorial, local communities in the subcontinent had depended on forest and common land resources for their daily survival. They provided a cushion for the people in times of drought, famine, and other natural calamities. But the colonial forest department took control of forest and began putting restriction on people's access to its resources through a series of forest acts and Thus, the forest dwellers were gradually pushed out of their natural habitat and forests were taken over and declared government reserves for colonial commercialization of forest resources and for serving the needs of imperial railways and military. This all had a major impact on the uh, ecology and upon the uh, some local communities. Uh, residing in uh, agri uh, agricultural communities and the forest related communities. The destruction of jungles, clearing of pastures, the high revenue fixed by the colonial government, institutions sub increasing substitution of cash crops for food grains, the commercial co uh, commerce and uh, corresponding shift from subsistence to market economy. These were all major departures from traditional agrarian system which led to elements of uncertainty and unsustainability, and finally to large scale mortality, both human and cattle. And cattle was a very major backbone of agriculture uh, and devastation through during famines. And uh, all this pushed the marginalized section of the local communities towards total ruin and disaster. Using the past as template for reconstructing the future needs, revaluation of current practices becomes relevant as they seek to balance the economic viability of livelihoods with long-term ecological sustainability. Importantly, the notion of regeneration which seeks to correct some of the missteps that have, been, that have led us to this point of environmental disaster has long been important to indigenous and pre-colonial traditional people it is believed that practices and principles of regenerative agriculture, uh, example, intercropping and agroforestry have emerged from community-based approaches to land management that have survived despite colonial for, uh, colonizing forces of Europeans. This constitutes as a basis for future agroecology built on applying principles in tune with local realities and indigenous knowledge. Uh, Towards meeting the fundamental issues of regeneration, the, globing nor the global north has taken the lead in declaring farmers as ecosystem regenerators. And the global south has been left a bit behind. Uh, transition towards regenerative agriculture faces major challenges in terms of, <coughs> in terms of costly watershed management, excuse me, vulnerability from agrochemical use, uneven access to land, unreliable farm incomes and high debt ratios, disconnect with urban, rural and suburban environments. On the other hand, there is 
a consensus of opinion by international agencies that the solution to food security is through agroecological sustainable models of agriculture. More than 70% of food consumed in developing countries where hunger is pervasive is grown in those countries, the majority of it by small scale farmers. Those farmers are the main people doing the feeding now, and they are only using 30% of agricultural resources to do it. In, in climate context, this becomes more relevant as it is driven by agro uh, ecological practices. Having said that, we must draw general attention to the fact that any attempt to develop environmental sustainability framework is fraught with dangers of getting into uh, uh, the discourse of finding false solutions in the name of sustainability. So one has to remain very cautious too. However, during transition period from industrial to natural agriculture, that, that means turning back, other viable alternatives may also be tested to work towards amelioration. It is therefore important to build theoretical perspectives on transitions, though they have limited role, but they provide important link to the present. Murray Bookchin's legacy in present day crisis opens up a new hope for right solution towards restoration. As a pioneer of social ecology, Murray Bookchin in his early writings sense that human social life must be seen in terms of a new unity, that the, that the time had come to integrate an ecological natural philosophy that means social philosophy, ecology, with a social philosophy based on freedom and mutual aid, anarchism or libertarian socialism, for which he stressed we have to decentralize, restore bio-regional bio, bio forms of food production and food cultivation, diversify our technologies, scale them down to human dimensions, and establish face-to-face -face, uh, forms of democracy. In the era of changing climate conditions that cross ecological and human governance boundaries, climate justice and local environmental injustices become more inter international and interconnected, requiring co-production of questions that lead to different views of governance and environmental actions. Therefore, it has been suggested that future directions in applied ecological researches be viewed through interdisciplinary lenses or rather transdisciplinary lenses that can clarify the visions of how the broader impacts of social injustices and ecological processes are integrated and are not somebody considered to be somebody else's problem. However, uh, such endeavors in the interest of holistic pluralism and to generate the best available knowledge can be undertaken in inter interdisciplinary settings that allow and embrace empirical, methodological, and theoretical diversity, as well as intense communication and reflexivity. Action ecology defined as intentional approach to designing and conducting, uh, uh, and conducting ecological research and education can address the environmental issues of concern in socio-ecological system. As a subfield of ecology related to action ecology, a revolutionary ecology can play an important intermediary role. Revolutionary ecology describes the transition towards and promotion of action ecology. As seen in previous discussion, increasing colonial expansion through its power and knowledge invasion undermined the democratic aspirations of the people living in colonized space. This can be corrected through ecosystem restoration which can reverse damage in terms of landscape context and can have bearing on socio-ecological components, more specifically species composition, ecological, ecological stability, and functions. There is a need to move towards actionable agenda in ecological research and education. In view of present-day pan pandemic crisis, new approaches with varying geographies and histories could be used as base material for laying down the foundations of futuristic action ecology. Now I have a few, few minutes to wrap up, uh, Anita, just to let you. 
okay and uh, well this is an action guide uh, for advocacy of citizen participation and uh, i will like to skip this and uh, uh, come to the next thing uh, since since revolutionary ecology as a subfield of applied ecology opens up a new vista for establishing new connections with nature it moves closer to more integrative and assimilatory role in this context social ecology offers a uh, re revolutionary and reconstructive political outlook challenging conventional views of the relationships between human communities and the natural world and offering an alternate alternative vision of pre confederated and directly democratic cities towns and neighborhoods seeking to harmonize these relationships and now i will like to move uh, to india and uh, in india uh, gandhi posited for the ideal community a state of enlightened anarchy under which socially responsible and morally disciplined individuals had no need of any polity whatsoever this vision was of course something never to be realized but always approximated gandhi saw that his ideal kind of polity dependent very much on cherishing above all the indian village which in his view formed the very foundation of indian civilization he believed that it was only within such a communal and close knit framework that proper human relationships can be nurtured he believed that key to india's progress lay both in its preservation and its regeneration interestingly the british intellectual hs uh, main had contended that ancient india had both uh, quasi judicial and quasi legislative powers gandhi built on this idea and campaigned for the development of such village republics as viable political units variously described as an apostle of applied human ecology and an early environmentalist in whole of gandhi's thoughts ideas and indeed his entire life he in evinced immense foresight in his analysis of modern civilization and manifested deep understanding of man nat nature relationship in his myriad scattered writings by his constant emphasis on creatively synthesizing rural development with industrial growth and his assertion on the centrality of human being in addressing various development issues he has unprecedentedly produced a healthy blend of environmental social development and economic imperatives gandhi appears closer to murray bookchin as gandhi's economic uh, philosophy also talks about fulfillment of basic needs of the people for this gandhi stressed on the use of natural resources and the wisdom of people for a constructive life in post pandemic world both action ecology and social ecology could serve as a bridge between gandhi and bookchin by playing a direct role in ecological restoration and building new theoretical perspectives on sustainability transition that's all thank you so much Thank you, Anita. Thank you very much for this uh, inspiring presentation. Thank you to all the panelists. Uh, we will now move on to a period of discussion. So we already have quite a few questions from uh, from the audience. So the first one is from Joseph, uh, and it's uh, directed to Johannes. So the question is: Since Morton is not a biochemist nor public health epidemiologist, but dwells in Texas and teaches rhetoric, po poetic, speculative discourses. Should his claims of social contagion be balanced against the state mandate contra vaccines? Cool. Um, so to address that shortly, I think so. Yeah, um, I think that in the philosophical sphere in which he's operating, it's important to take these claims seriously, seeing as he's talking about massively dispersed entities beyond vaccination uh, specifically. I'm just applying his. Um, methodology to vaccination. Um, as, you know, one of the tenets of social ecology, there is this democratization of the sciences as well as philosophy. And as philosophy as a, a more democratically attainable field, seeing as a lack of barrier to access due to access to labs or formal education, I think that there's a lot of space to take in a wide range of considerations when it comes to issues like these philosophical problems. Um, 
I, I think given the history of social ecology, especially with Bookchin's um, path to being a, a prominent academic or a philosophical figure, it's clear that, you know, just because people don't necessarily have the, uh, the institutional credentials to talk about things doesn't mean that they necessarily don't have a valid point to make on those issues, given that their rhetoric is strong. I think that's the only uh, mitigating point, which is why I critiqued his, his argument in my presentation. Thank you, Ioannis. Thank you for your answer. Uh, we now have a, a question that is directed to all the panelists, uh, to everybody uh, from Jordan. So uh, he says, I think that it's clear uh, instrumentalist rationalism and materialism has acted as an anti-ecological lens for viewing the natural world. Do you all think that restoration and technology can be synthesized uh, with the needs of communities? Uh, do we need to bring back the comments for this to be achieved? Question mark. And in the American context, this will need to be an entirely new institution <coughs> separated from the settler colonial state. So that's an that's open question to all panelists. Uh, anybody has, uh, wants to start with an answer? Uh, I, I would like to talk about the commons part. Um, yes, yeah, so I believe in uh, creating more commons is becoming really key points during this global climate change and climate emergency times. Uh, but at the same time, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> As you know, uh, tragedy of commons is always uh, possible. Uh, we need to do uh, more research and <clears throat> uh, we need to learn from the past, from different countries' experiences, how the commons are uh, failing. But what are the reasons? Uh, from time to time, uh, from region to region, for example, in Turkey, climate is different in the Black Sea region. People's attitude is different. Um, and in uh, the Mediterranean touristical region. So we need to learn from the past experience at the same time, how uh, people's attitude and people's relationship is changing in difficult times. So a tragedy of commons, yeah. Yes, we need to create commons, uh, but we need to work on um, how we might not, we shouldn't be failed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emmet, for your answer. Um, would anybody else have something to, to add? I'd, I'd just like to add something brief on to the yeah. concept of bringing back the commons. Um, I get hesitant anytime there's a mention of bringing back any nostalgic uh, cultural or historic uh, phenomenon because that's feeding into a false memory of something that may or may not have been. Um, and as such, I think the first position that you offer is stronger, that technology being synthesized to serve the needs of the communities offers value. Um, I think when we engage with this kind of retroactive nostalgia about uh, something like the commons, we can slip into a trap of uh, mythologizing the past in a way that leads down the road of uh, like ecofascism. So I do think it's good to use communal ownership, but I have uh, hesitancy around the commons, especially as we get into like anarcho-primitivism or similar ve veins of thought that lead to this eco-fascist framing of similar structures. Thank you, thank you for this additional insight, uh, Johannes. Um, we now have a few questions for uh, Anita. So Anita will read the, those questions. The first one is from uh, Georgios. So the expression colonization tendencies of Europeans was mentioned. Europeans are counted in hundreds of millions now and tens of millions in the past. Do they have a collective guilt for colonization? Aren't these types of labels mentioned problematic and falsely accusatory? Does it help to blame huge populations for the actions of elites and ruling classes? So that would be the first question. 
I can maybe read the second and you could answer to, to both, is that's fine for you. Um, so that question is from Emmet. So thank you for your interesting talk. Just wondering how we could, how we can exchange knowledge and experience in pandemic times from farmers to farmers. As you know, this is the main problem in agroecology because national borders are closed and every nation's focus on feeding their own people. So that would be the first question for you, uh, Anita. So your, your microphone is now mute. We cannot hear you for now. Yeah. Is, now uh, you can now. hear me? Perfectly, yes. thank you. Uh, I'm sorry if I sounded like that, that uh, uh, I, I don't want to sound accusatory for entire Europeans and nor do I think uh, that they are responsible for uh, everything, uh, every trouble that has come here. But uh, I, uh, meant colon the uh, colonial government, the British colonial government, and wherever uh, which whichever country has to pass through the colonial path, they had similar kind of problems. Uh, so I meant that, and I didn't want to. Uh, I don't say I don't mean that uh, the all the Europeans and the entire population of Euros Europeans should be blamed for. Uh, the problems that uh, cropped up in the agricultural pattern, in the regional agroecological pattern in India or elsewhere. So I hope I am able to make myself clear. About the second thing, uh, uh, yeah, that is true. Uh, these are tough times, COVID-19 are very tough times and uh, we need to uh, connect with each other and share views and share our experiences and knowledge about the uh, local uh, circumstances, local situation in countries so that we can build up uh, some model or come to some conclusion about, the, uh, about how we can uh, address the issues before uh, agriculture and before sustainable development. But, uh, and uh, this is the problem that these times are tough and every nation is uh, centered about over its own problem. But these times will pass and the, like we are having this conference and we are discussing the legacy of Maria Bookchin and we are trying to uh, find our way, illumine our path through uh, the views and through the thinking of uh, uh, of a philosopher who was here 100 years back. So uh, this knowledge, this thing, everything, this will uh, help uh, these, the, uh, the things we are discussing here, these will show the way and we will be able to address the problems of future. So we need not be uh, depressed or need not be pessimistic about the future. We have to have hope for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anita. Actually, there is uh, two more questions on, on YouTube and uh, actually they are also directed to you, Anita. So we will then uh, close the, this session. Um, so the questions go, in the past, I have heard of participatory practices and commoning in Kerala. Are there still communities there that engage in democratic practices? If yes, how they relate to ecology? Uh, are there also other democratic grassroots examples uh, about around India that carry emancipatory potential and can be analyzed through a bookshinist, social ecologist perspective? Well, as I said earlier, I'm a new entrant in this field and uh, my knowledge is basically confined to uh, Indian uh, condition and then uh, I'm not qualified to speak about uh, other places. So maybe next time when I get more, uh, when I learn more, then maybe I will be, address, be able to address this. Okay, thank you very much, Anita, then for, for this extra comment. So 
um, it's time to close this session. I will finish with a, a comment that has been posted on, on the Zoom about uh, what Johannes has just answered. So it's from Jordan. Uh, Johannes, you made a great point. I think there is value to using the past as a way to imagine the future. Eleanor Ostrom won a Nobel Prize for using present and past communities who maintain the commons to understand how they can be managed sustainably. Ecological science can complement indigenous ecological knowledge and help us rebuild socio-ecological systems. But we do need to be sure that they are being built by and within the local community. So on this uh, very nice concluding comment, I think we can uh, close that uh, this session. So as you know, we will ha now have a break. Um, the break will be uh, about 25 minutes. We can come back or yeah, half an hour. We can come back at uh, half past, no, 45 past, sorry, or quarter to quarter to what well, depends where you are, but at 45, <laughs> basically. So we can come back at 45 in a bit less than half an hour, okay? And uh, then Magali will be chairing the, the session and I will talk about future di research directions and book presentations. Hello, Magali. Hello. Thank you very much. Hi, Yavor, can you hear me? Hello, Fede, we hear you, yes. So I should be on time because I negotiated with the family to be on.
Hello. So yes, you can hear me now, I suppose. Uh, nice to see you all for that conference of TRIES. I am uh, Magali Fricode from the uh, board of TRIES. And um, I will have the honor and the pleasure to moderate this session. Uh, this uh, session, uh, the coming session, uh, talks about future research. Uh, as you may know, TRIES promotes the link between the praxis and social ecology and, and, the, and the research uh, so that we can go further in, in the uh, social ecology uh, field. So uh, I'd like to welcome for this session, uh, first Federico Venturini, uh, who is also from uh, TRI's board, and we will uh, introduce uh, his new research or some reflections, uh, I suppose, so Federico, on uh, towards a militant social ecology approach. It's uh, the floor is yours, Federico, thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, could you please allow me the video? I think it's Yabor, the organizer. Yes, because we see a beautiful picture, but uh, it would leave. Okay. Okay. Nice. Here we are. Now we are live. And also, I would like to share my screen uh, with. Uh, my presentation. Okay, is it full screen? Can you see it? Okay, so maybe let's start from the beginning. Maybe it's better. Okay, so um, I would like to thank you, first of all, uh, Joanna, Theo, and Javor. I think uh, that uh, the four of us uh, managed to organize a very nice uh, uh, conference. It was a very quite challenging time, uh, but the end uh, we managed, and I think that the attendance and also the, the presentation, the level of the presentation is, is very high. So I'm, I'm very pleased of all the efforts and energy that uh, we put uh, in it. So let's, uh, let's start. Um, I've been looking at social ecology from a research point of view in the last, um, uh, 10 years, more or less, uh, and before uh, I've been uh, uh, more an activist uh, from for the same for the same time. So in this period of time, I try to um, understand how uh, uh, we can learn in a vocal way between praxis theory and also in two different figures. Uh, uh, as an activist, as a researcher. So the presentation of today will be quite theoretical, but uh, is stemming from my experiences that I had in this, in this period and the literature that I, that I read. So um, I will focus on, on the methodology part of social ecology. So um, first of all, I will have a very brief introduction on what is um, social ecology and the tradition of social ecology on research methodology, and then I will go in the in the in the important part uh, of the presentation, where I will highlight uh, my proposal of a new research approach for social ecology. First of all, I will introduce uh, the an overall concept uh, that is uh, solidarity. That is, um, can I say, is. Uh, is setting the scene uh, for the four pillars uh, of uh, uh, for a social ecology research approach uh, that are movement relevant theory, decolonized knowledge, participatory action research, and militant research. So the four of us, these four aspects are um, research approach uh, that uh, will uh, help to develop a new social ecology research approach. So. Um, uh, in the social ecology tradition, we can see that has been developed by, by Murray Bookchin. Um, we can define social ecology as uh, the recognition of the social basis for environmental problems, 
a philosophy and activist practice that attributes imbalance in human environmental relations to hierarchies and forms of domination in such a relationship and vice versa. I think that in this definition, there are some key concepts that are very important to highlight. First um, is, um, well, at the end, he said that it's about hierarchies and domination. But before he said also that it's about a philosophy, a theory, but it's also a practice. So um, there, are, there are two aspects that um, uh, live together in social ecology the theory uh, and then also the, the practice that can be uh, outside in, in the world. So we have some also actors for this uh, social change that we that we hope uh, that we uh, try to push with social ecology that are social movements or grassroots initiatives. I don't want to go in the details, but um, um, so I would like just to touch on this. But the key uh, the key actors for social ecology in order to bring change in inside the society are social movements and or we can define them, them grassroots initiatives. Then they can be declined in different way. Uh, they can be educational project, direct action. So action that are not mediated by the state can be uh, communalism or whatever we want to call them, but the actors are, uh, are these, these two. Um, um, if this is definition of, of social ecology, um, so far we had mainly uh, historical accounts or descriptions of social movement uh, practices. So we don't have um, um, any research or paper or book that is very analytical and uh, in a bionic vocal way in order to learn from the practice of, of social movements and to inform and social ecology and vice versa. Usually the practice is uh, social ecology say this, uh, and then social movements are doing something similar, and then we can make uh, maybe a com comparison, uh, but there is nothing very analytical. So there is no methodology, uh, no research approach in exploring uh, social movements, practices, and theories. And there is not much of this approach then that is um, okay. Social movements are doing these things and trying to to do in that in that way. How can we absorb? How can we learn? How can we um, translate the practices and theories of social movements inside social ecology? It seems that this in for now it seems very prescriptive as as approach. So here we are. Uh, I have um, two questions. One is to how to analyze social movement experiences. And then is how to build a bionivocal relation between social ecology and social movements in an effort to learn from each other. So the overall aim is to establish a research approach in line with the aims and ethics of social ecology. So ethics that is informed by dialectic naturalism, that I will, will not explore that. Uh, but for sure, the ethical naturalism and all the ethics and the, um, and the philosophical insight should be taken into account when we do research in order to have always uh, an interconnection between uh, the aims, uh, the theory, the practice, uh, the, the, the methods, and also uh, the aims, the aims that overall is to change uh, this uh, uh, system that is not working. So, um, so far, social ecology offer insight, uh, not as a rigid ideology or dogma, but rather as a framework for inquiry that is explicitly oriented toward harmonizing people's relationship with the natural world. This is a quote from uh, uh, Kodorkov, uh, Daniel Kodorkov, um, um, that this uh, underlines how social ecology should be a framework for in inquiry uh, and not uh, a, rigid, a rigid dogma. So how can we move forward uh, towards this, um, this, uh, this approach or this, uh, this aim? Uh, I think that the, the first step uh, the, is to use solidarity. I think that um, any uh, research uh, from social ecology, 
point of view should work uh, from solidarity. And is there is a quote that I really love to, um, to repeat, I said that several times, um, that, that comes from, from the 70s. Um, if you have come to help me, I don't need your help. But you, if you have come because your liberation is tied to mine, come let us work together. So, and then there is another one from the Trapeze Collective. And in both of these, uh, of these quotes, uh, there is um, this, um, this, uh, this understanding that um, when we work, when we act in solidarity, there is no division between, between us, between the people. There is no researcher, there is no activist, uh, but we are all together in an effort to change uh, uh, the reality. And I think that this should be the underlying concept uh, uh, for any research effort. So, and that, in that way, we also blur the division between activists, researchers, common people, and, and so on. And also to be in solidarity, it will enable us um, to interconnect with any social struggles that we are in or we can link in. If I work in Brazil or I, Italian, I can work in UK or Brazil or with the Kurdish movement, uh, but I can understand that we, that we are all in solidarity. So I can, uh, I can develop a, a struggle altogether. So if solidarity is the overall um, concept for this um, research approach, then there is another tradition that I would like to bring in as a first pillar that is movement relevant theory. When we, uh, when we work, when we try to develop uh, um, some research, I think that the, the, the aim is to, to build a theory that is relevant for the, um, the social actor that we are in solidarity with, that is uh, social movements. So this knowledge uh, should be relevant, useful, and readable for social movements. If we, if we are producing knowledge for the sake of it, and if it's not readable to social movements, that I think that is not, uh, it's not uh, uh, worth to do this, uh, this kind of, of research. And always remember that um, for research, and it's not, the point is not to uh, the interpretation of the world, but the organization of transformation of the world as also Marx, I remember, uh, long ago. And then another pillar for uh, a social ecology research approach is uh, the important to have a decolonized knowledge. Uh, I've been argued uh, in other presentation that social ecology has a very um, Western uh, approach. That is, is not a mistake. Um, it happened to do, be developed in the Western, in the Western uh, countries, but then now it should also open uh, to different approaches and to different tradition and histories, uh, because out there, there are very important, uh, important uh, experiences, very cool people where social ecology can learn and can be inspired and then uh, develop something, something new. Uh, and then there is a, a quote from Marcos, uh, the subcommandante Marcos, that is always uh, stressing that uh, the struggles um, are coming from our reality, but that they are all bound uh, together. Um, so we can start from our localities uh, and then we can start to link with others uh, and, and then uh, learn from each other but then to, trans to translate you know the, the struggles in our realities and then to again interconnect in a global global revolution um, and then the, the third the third pillar for a social ecology research approach is a participatory action research i'm not sure how many people are uh, familiar with this with this approach um, but um, the, the, the part is, uh, is coming from uh, uh, the need of specific community. 
So the researcher is going um, to the to the community and is asking, do you need something? Uh, do you need some help? And then the community will say, okay, we need this kind of uh, help uh, uh, from you. So, um, and then the research is, is built, but it's built uh, not just um, the researcher, but it's, the research is blend inside the community and inside the, inside the, uh, the research itself. So in this way, we have a pragmatic outcome of the research. It's not something uh, for the sake of it, but it's something that is uh, that has been asked by the by the community itself. And the researcher had, was at the service. He gave all the insight, all the knowledge that uh, they had uh, in order to develop this piece of knowledge that was needed uh, by, uh, by the community itself. And then the, four, the, the, last, uh, the last pillar uh, is uh, the militant research. Um, this is something very similar to the PAR approach, but is, um, is, is putting a spin, a more militant spin. Uh, because uh, PAR can be, um, can be any research at the service of, of the community, uh, but militant research is something more uh, oriented towards uh, social change. So again, is, uh, is, uh, the aim of uh, militant research is producing knowledge useful for militant and activist need, not just for the community itself. And it has aims and values for radical militants. Um, and uh, and uh, from the second quote, I highlighted that uh, in this way, research becomes synergized and collaborative with those struggles for, for, for social change. And um, so it's something similar, but at the same time different from that. So um, I try to be very fast, and this is my last last, li last slide. Um, I I summarize that I'm suggesting a new research approach for social ecology that is informed by the concept of solidarity and is uh, built on. Uh, Four pillars: um, movement relevant theory, decolonized knowledge, participatory action research, and uh, militant uh, approach. And uh, just to conclude, I think that uh, when we act in solidarity with uh, social actors, we learn about them. So we discover information that could not be assessed in other ways. But at the same time, we learn with them. And so we share experiences together as a learning process. And then also at the end, we learn from them as they told us. So in this way, um, we try to build a bionivocal way um, where we have information from social movements. Uh, we learn something, uh, we learn about from them, but also with them. And social ecology can always uh, progress and is not just an ossified theory, but can develop uh, uh, thanks to the lessons of uh, social movements and social actors uh, that are struggles uh, every day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Federico. Uh, thank you for this uh, uh, great speech and uh, also very, uh, which was uh, in the frame of the time. Uh, you mentioned, I think, something very important, which is that uh, social ecology research is not the rigid framework and uh, dogma, but it's uh, uh, a framework of inquiry so that we can uh, reharmonizing re uh, nature with um, with people, so I think it's it's very interesting. So let's now give the floor. Uh, we have a presentation made by uh, Krini uh, Kafitis, uh, Gis, Sorry, uh, maybe Theo, you can you can put it now. It's um, and then uh, thank you.
it's okay? So maybe I should add that it, it's, a present, it's a presentation of, uh, of a research uh, by uh, Krini Kafiris and uh, Eve Olney, sorry for that, I, I've forgotten uh, Eve, sorry Eve, uh, called the Radical Institute, Developing Sustainable Social Ecological Praxis. Okay, so is you... it working, Theo? Yes, it uh, it crashed, but now we are back. So okay, I'm just gonna put it again, and it should work. So now you should see the screen. Is it the case? Do you see the screen? Okay. Yes. Okay. Now let's try with the sound and uh, for a few seconds, and we we'll see if it works. <laughs> You heard that? I think not, not, not very well, I think, as, as far as I'm concerned, but. Okay, so let me see, there is not an option for sound. Um, this is a presentation based on- Was that yes, better? Very nice, okay. Okay, okay, good. So give me one second. Okay, now it's going. On a paper by myself, Karina Kafiris and Ivoni. Um, we are founders of the Radical Institute. And our paper today is about how the Radical Institute is engaged in developing sustainable social ecologic practices. So this paper then explores issues drawn from Mary Bookchin's vision of the ecological and democratic transformation of society through a new form of politics by presenting some of the work being developed by ourselves within the Radical Institute. Um, so within this uh, presentation, we'll just go through very briefly some of the programs. Um, and also, I suppose it's important to mention that we're a transnational initiative but I'm based in Cork and Karini is based in Athens. Um, and also that the Radical Institute is part of a broader scheme that is again based in Cork City in Ireland um, of, um, called the Living Commons and it's a broader social, social ecological scheme. And we currently have a space in the Cork City Centre. So before we get started, we'll just do a brief overview about Marie Bookchin's vision, because this is crucial to our work. So Bookchin has, set, has, has talked about the ecological and democratic transformation of society through a new form of politics. And this new form of politics is based on participation in direct democratic popular assemblies and institutions which are rooted in community self-governance at different independent levels. And they come together in confederations of eco-communities. It's through this form of living politics that the domination and hierarchies of capitalism can be challenged and that collective power can be used to construct a communalist society based on equality and freedom. Um, and just to reflect on um... Bookchin's, some of the Bookchin's descriptions of how social ecological organizational structures um, of equality um, might be um, configured. Radical Institute is particularly imp um, interested in how the processes of reasoning play out through um, decision making. Um, so, for example, um, Bookchin's description or conception of communalism as the overarching political category most suitable to encompass the fully thought out and systemic views of social ecology. He, he describes communalism um, as it seeks to recapture the meaning of politics in its broadest, most emancipatory sense, to fulfill the historic potential of the municipality as the development arena of mind and discourse a free society based on a shared common humanity, freed of domination as well as material exploitation, um, indeed recreated as a rational arena for human creativity in all spheres of life. The municipality becomes the ethical space then for the good life. 
Communalism expresses an abiding concept and practice of political life formed by a dialectic of social development and reason. And again, we are particularly concerned within our programs within that last, the dialectic of social development and reason and how that plays out in process. So our focus is what kinds of practices and processes are necessary. So this is kind of the main focus of the Radical Institute. Um, how does Vic, book, how can Bookchin's vision become a reality within dem direct democratic popular assemblies and institutions, the ones he referred to in his work? So what kinds of practices and processes are necessary to mitigate against abuses of power based on hierarchy and domination within the assemblies and institutions? What kinds of practices and processes are necessary to challenge the domination and hierarchies of capitalism as they play out at every level of politics? And what kinds of practices and processes are necessary to make communalism a reality? So Radical Institute um, explores how arts and cultural practices can actually address and answer these questions. So we look at how through the arts and cultural practices, we can promote and sustain radical and social ecological change. And we often through our programs, or not often, actually through every program, we explore and develop how sustainable organizing and collaboration, um, how those practices and processes that most interest us can come together to work to create a culture of care. And so our, our definition of cultural care is very is radical, it's feminist, it's political. And we, we suggest that a culture of care is exactly what's needed to mitigate against the abuses of power the book Shin described. It's necessary to support participation, transform social relations, and to make the lived politics that he writes about a reality. Um, we do this through many different ways, but largely at the moment through workshops, mentoring, collaborative, cultural, interactive projects, trainings, culture and art production and research. So what kinds of understandings then, skills and engagements are needed for citizens to sustain full and equal participation in deliberations and decision making, particularly in the current, you know, how we are currently uh, facing enormous challenges. Um, and the big issue for us, um, and this is one of the big issues that's really kind of overlooked at the moment. And um, in our understanding and in our experience, is the cause for most of the kind of failure of such sort of uh, collective and, and um, um, assembly work. So we then work collectively with others through art and culture to try and make visible um, the organizational processes and practices which reproduce invisible oppressions and hierarchies and groups, especially those based on gender. Collectively build organizational cultures of care, which are radical, deeply political, feminist, and eco systemic, and cultivate the social ecological subject. So, what we mean uh, when we talk about making the invisible visible um, is that we, again, work with others within the very sort of idiosyncratic um, and specific contexts of, of particular collectives um, or assembly groups. And we together explore organizational processes and practice, which then can make visible the reproduction of these invisible oppressions and hierarchies um, within those groups. Um, these two slides. Show some of the kind of issues that I think would be familiar to most of us um, who have been part of any kind of um, collective group. Um, the, it might be a bit difficult to see them on the slide there, but just read out some. Uh, so some of the issues that have already arisen are an insincere attempt at addressing um, issues, patriarchal power, um, uh, changes made without um, the consultation of others, no space given for expression of needs, etc. So these are the type of issues we're exploring with, with groups at the moment. So we've already mentioned that our work has at its core the building of radical feminist political cultures of care. And as we said before, we think this is necessary so that Murray Bookchin's vision can become a reality, a lived reality. So we draw from feminist writing um, to posit that care is in fact not a selfish, indulgent practice. Care is in fact 
collective care can only be collective, the kind of care we're interested in. Um, this kind of care takes into consideration that individuals have multifaceted needs because those needs deal or rather emerge from their multifaceted nature. Groups, collectives, and communities also have multifaceted needs. So in our work, we explore, acknowledge, and address what these different needs are. And based on that kind of acknowledging and exploration, we then use that to build solidarity into our everyday practices. So this is just to give you an example of one of the projects, uh, the programs that we're involved in at the moment. It's um, in collaboration with a Cork-based arts organization and funded by the Community Foundation of Ireland for Ireland, and it's called Studios of Sanctuary. It offers four marginalized artists who are interested in working within socially engaged practice, um, 15 month mentorship and training um, residencies. So again, without going through everything there that's um, you know, within our program, just to give you an idea that, that um, again, our focus very much is within the kind of subjectivity of the artists themselves, then um, also with the how we engage with communities around us um, and yeah, and what those kind of processes, what sort of processes are involved um, within specific contexts. So you can see there at the at the top of the slide, part one. Um, so the first couple of months is very much a personal focus on the artist, um, where we work again collaboratively with uh, the artists themselves um, on creating workshops that, folk, that um, look at the interrelationships between self and others. We look at power relations, identity, multiple ways of knowing, um, as well as then um, involve them within trainings and workshops on self-care. Um, according to the sustainable activist approach. Um, again, at the core of what we do throughout all the different kind of aspects of our work is an effort to cultivate the social ecological subject. So in keeping with Bookshin throughout our projects and our work, we keep in mind, and that is reflected in the actual way that the projects are sort of set out, that individuals are not just minds individuals are conceptualized holistically as human beings with minds emotions and bodies they exist and interact within overlapping systems of relations including power relations so just to return briefly then to bookshin's thinking on where the social ecological subject might situate themselves the main concerns of radical institute always remain within the processes of, of how the connection with others is being rationalized within non-oppressive modes of communication so, for example, um, as Bookchin describes social ecology as a coherent vision of social development that for decades argued that we must reorder social relations so that humanity can live in a protective balance with the natural world. Um, and in short, social ecology favors management plans and regulations formulated democratically by popular assemblies, not freewheeling forms of behavior that have their origin in individual eccentricities. What we mean when we talk about cultures of care in relation to our work again we'd like to stress the point is that the kind of kind of care that we are interested in is deeply political radical and feminist it's often misunderstood which is why we're stressing it so it's only through this kind of um, organizational cultures of care that we believe that or we suggest that the live politics butch Shin has outlined can be embodied and sustained for true radical ecological and political change. So again, just to finish up then and go very briefly through some of the existing programs or the ongoing programs that were involved in in Cork um, within the Living Commons space. Um, the, this slide indicates some of the workshops that were involved in within our PEDIA program, which is a, a program where young people can become engaged in social ecological approaches to citizenship through collaborative creative programs. And the images you see there are, are, are ongoing collaborations with uh, Hungarian artist Esther Nemethy's Magical School and Cork-based Steve Granger's um, New School program. And this slide indicates um, the new uh, steering group that we're setting up in Cork City. Again, um, around the Living Commons space. 
um, where we are trying to uh, conceive a community land trust, the, the like of which you can you know, already find in England and Europe, but uh, has only become legally possible in Ireland this year. So um, um, again, we are doing that by uh, working collaboratively with existing groups, um, such as the Irish Regenerative Land Trust, um, and we collaborate with other artists, youth workers and young people um, to connect the social ecological practices to specific focuses on um, community led housing and biodiversity. And this is again a really nice project that's ongoing where we invite different groups of teenagers into the space um, and ask them um, there's a great need for a dignified space for teenagers in Cork, particularly uh, indoor spaces because of the weather. Um, and again, it's a, a, where they can become involved with the idea of running an autonomous space within their own assembly processes. Um, and finally, this is a project again, it was funded by the Irish Arts Council, which is a reconfigurable assembly structure. It's this um, mobile structures that basically um, are offered to different groups and collectives to use. So that concludes, as you can hear, that our alarm just went off. So that's our literally, literally our 15 minutes. Um, uh, thank you for watching our presentation. And should you have any questions, um, apologies that we can't be there in person or to answer any questions right now. But should you have any questions, if you follow the link here, you can get in touch with us through the, the website. OK, thanks again. And thanks to uh, Yavar and Joanna and everybody at Trise for inviting us to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I think that even Crini, you're not here with us, but uh, really thank you uh, to, to Joanna for um, uh, having allowed their participation. Um, this is very inspiring, no? this um, engagement with arts, culture and care, uh, which are uh, living, changing, um, uh, which are very uh, livable, changing. Uh, uh, ways um, of uh, of uh, organizing. Uh, so I'd like to give now the speech uh, to Marle Paiva. Uh, you're here, Marle? Yes. Okay. And Hi, uh, Marle. Marle. Hello. Hello. Hi. Nice to see you, uh, Marle. You, you will uh, talk uh, about your research uh, on uh, rethinking the notion of nature of nature in international law. So the floor is yours. Let's go. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank uh, all the organizers of the of the Trise conference in light of the 100 years of uh, Bookchin, in Murray Bookchin. It has been a, an honor participating and I would like to, to talk about this point which I think is, it comes, uh, the conference comes very timely in light of the start of the, of the conference of the state parties in the UNFCC um, starting tomorrow in Glasgow, uh, which uh, for which I think the ideas and thoughts of uh, Murray Bookchin come very uh, influential. Um, I would like to start by uh, pointing out to the need of the correction, of a correction in the, in the approach, uh, in the relational approach between nature and humans, which is reflected in international law in all its forms, including international human rights law. Uh, there is a need of correction. Why? Why I, I, I think uh, I, I point out this in my research because international law embeds and split and an implicit split between humans and the natural world, which uh, facilitates and legitimizes the exploitation of nature, and which now we are seeing in the, which are seeing uh, that are causing the cause, uh, climate change, ecological, ecological crisis that are, at, uh, which uh, are at the core of this, uh, this uh, split between the human and natural world are 
at the core of this uh, of this crisis that now present uh, are present in the world as one of our most uh, our greatest challenges as a society. Uh, social in in light of these challenges, social ecology provides a wider view where humans and nature are uh, presented as a part of a same unity, as, as, as a part of a wholeness that, uh, that form part of an, uh, um, a wholeness that provides a, an ecological dimension to international law, which is lacking. Um, in, this, in this context, I would like to highlight the concept of wholeness provided by uh, Murray Bookchin. He say that uh, by wholeness, I mean, I mean a varying le level of actualization, an unfolding of the wealth of particularities that are latent in as yet underdeveloped potentiality. Uh, today, 15 years after his death, uh, this proves that it remains very, it remains influential and relevant in this world that we start now seeing the world as a, as a wholeness, as in we as human beings and our laws, our rules, as a part of a, of a wholeness and that nature is reflected so in, in our, our laws that they now is lacking. Um, I would like to, to dig in, in this part of the divide between humans and nature uh, present in international law. Uh, there is a misunderstanding uh, in the relationship between humans and nature, uh, which is presented in international law, uh, including in its uh, part dedicated to the protection of nature, like, like uh, as it is international environmental law. Um, in this context, there is, is, there is an imaginary split between the human and natural world that uh, do not allow us to protect and to, to protect and preserve the natural environment as a part, as a crucial part of the, uh, of the protection also of the human beings and non-human beings. Instead, we have seen and provided the, uh, in inter through international law, the means, the legal means to exploit nat nature in a way to cause uh, environmental degradation uh, that now uh, is part in, uh, of and helps to, to develop, to create this uh, climate and ecological crisis. For example, uh, International law provide facilitates multinational co corporations to exploit, to uh, degrade, to contaminate the world without uh, without proper sanctions or without sanctions at all. It provides a permissive. Uh, the uh, international law provide a privileged uh, legal space to multinational corporations to uh, exploit nature in the not in the in general but particularly in the global south this has this has uh, provided the means to uh, not only to to contribute to, to the climate and, and ecological crisis but at the same time uh, to prejudice to uh, undermine the rights that international law is, pro is supposed to protect the rights of the most vulnerable in society or the human rights in general. For example, uh, there, is a, there's, there is a paradox in, interna uh, in, international, in international law that uh, those uh, in light of, of the climate crisis, that those who are the most, uh, who contribute the least to the problem of climate change are those who are at the at the up upfront of the of the consequences of of the of climate change. Those who contribute, those countries and communities that contributed the least to the problem of climate change are those who are uh, the most uh, most uh, severely in, impacted by the consequences of climate change. Um, 
despite the the science, the climate science uh, warnings that we have to change our understanding uh, or our behavior in the way in which uh, we allow or laws in governments allow, for example, corporations to behave in a way to exploit nature and, for example, create uh, create or give the the international legal framework framework that allows uh, corporations to produce uh, greenhouse gases emissions. Uh, instead, uh, we continue this, these emissions continue being allowed, and uh, these are producing climate change. The in climate science, the international uh, uh, intergovernmental panel on climate change has warned that uh, in Byron, uh, uh, greenhouse global emission, uh, greenhouse gases emission should decrease up to a maximum of 1.5 uh, degrees in the next, uh, in the coming years uh, for 2030. This means that we have less than 10 years to dramatically reduce our carbon emissions, uh, still we are in a way to have more than uh, three uh, degrees of increase in the global temperatures. So uh, in this context, the, the thoughts of uh, Murray Bookchin become influential and crucial, especially in, in the, uh, by providing um, environmental and ecological dimension to international law, which is absolutely lacking in, in international law and in international legal frameworks like uh, human rights. <laughs> in human rights is the, considered the most anthropocentric um, of all legal orders. And this puts human at the center of the protection but completely separated of its natural world without considering that this is, a, this is instead crucial to, to the uh, actual well-being of humans. And it sees still detached from its natural environment. And uh, I would like to highlight before the, the time comes to, for me to, to end that international law uh, still is very in this, in this position where international law in its uh, all legal frameworks continue being anthropocentric and promote and represent nature as an, as an entity external and hier hierarchically divided from, from, the, from the human, uh, it's very limited to uh, provide a meaningful means to address the ecological and climate crisis. Um, uh, it's, that is why the, the concept of wholeness that uh, provides a social ecology, it's uh, crucial and relevant and is as simple as that. While we continue seeing the humans separated from nature, from its natural environment, and we don't see this fundamental concept of wholeness uh, uh, as stated by Murray Bookchin, uh, we will not be able to address meaningfully uh, the, the problems of uh, the, the uh, ongoing crisis of a climate and ecological crisis. It is uh, therefore uh, important that we uh, continue uh, research in, uh, uh, in international law within international legal systems, however, keeping in mind the limitedness, the limitedness that of uh, international law to address these problems because it has fundamental mistakes and uh, wrong assumptions on uh, the relational approach between humans and nature. I don't know how I am going with time. Please let me know. You're, you're perfect. I think uh, if you finish now, it will let us um, have a little exchange, but uh, mm -hmm. it's okay for you? Yes, Ale, so basically, I will you... just uh, wrap, wrapping up a note. I would like to, uh, to stress then that the climate and ecological crisis call us for urgent and far-reaching and radical changes of, uh, of international law. Uh, 
we need to reimagine international law. As uh, Murray uh, Buchen said, the reimagination is is uh, is timely. We need it to in order to to consider to to address this uh, uh, climate crisis and the ecological crisis. I, I with that note, I close for the for for questions and continue with comments about this. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Moto. Yes, indeed, it's very important now to see the, also the dialectical relation between uh, international law, which is uh, mostly state law, but at the same time, the only framework we have maybe to to get further states and to to govern for for the international communities. No, yes. so you have a question. I will begin if you don't mind uh, to, for the with this question from Emmet. Uh, that is in the chat because there are kind of uh, uh, of discussions uh, that uh, that are being addressed on the chat uh, between Federico and Stuart Hill. So Moto, what do you think about ecocid from international law perspective? Because there um, mountain there. Uh, sorry, I cannot read. I think there are. Uh, Maybe, maybe, Emmet, you can you can ask the question directly. Um, actually, it was really interesting presentation. Thank you very much. I have learned a lot. Um, I would like to ask. Um, um, there are mountain ranges, rivers are polluted, mountains are under the threat for mining. Uh, they are <clears throat> exceeding the national borders. How? Uh, people can collaborate uh, from national, I mean, ecocide perspective um, from um, international law. I mean, every country has different rules. Uh, I mean, people, how people can unite and <clears throat> protect their um, natural resources. Thank you. Yes. Uh, ecocides, uh, just uh, to give an idea, provides the the idea that uh, that uh, damaging nature should be considered uh, a crime under international law. That uh, damaging or uh, nature in a way to to uh, destroy it, it should be considered a, uh, a crime under international law because it 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 is harming not only the natural environment, but also in this anthropocentric way of thinking, also a uh, human's uh, needs and human's uh, uh, rights as well. But as long as ecocides provides this opportunity, but is a relatively a new concept uh, in international law. It has uh, it, it is in international in research actually, but it has not yet in been embraced in international law. It is is not uh, considered a, a crime, for example, under the Rome Statute. Or not there has been uh, yet a lot uh, written about it. However, what we uh, what. Uh, we can uh, do is uh, putting pressure on our governments in in considering a uh, Buchin's uh, thoughts, the at municipal a local level from our from our cities from our municipalities, putting pressure to getting more and more uh, eco ecological or nature uh, conscious policies and laws in a way to to protect. Uh, the environment, uh, for example, the, uh, in a way to uh, to control uh, natural exploitation, or as as you have said, uh, in the with the exploitation of with mining that has that is, is causing a lot of harm not only to the communities where mining uh, is uh, developed, but also to the natural environment. Uh, that those are are uh, through our local level throughout all levels of society this, this can be promoted in a way that at the end this is uh, reflected in international law not only on our local or national laws but also in international law and this is what is 
uh, hopefully happening at some point in in the context of the of the conference of state parties in the UNFCC see that is happening uh, is uh, starting next week for example okay thank you uh thank you we have a uh, like a kind of uh, discussion online between uh, federico and stuart around uh, is there a specific vision on uh, australian uh, social ecology research um i would suggest uh, or not is it compatible with bookshin's uh, um uh, uh, read, uh, with bookshin think uh, south sorry so do you want to have uh, maybe because we do not have time to get into this uh, this discussion uh, that much, but Federico and uh, and the Stuart, do you want to have the floor maybe for one or two minutes uh, just to say a word on on what you're discussing on the chat? Are you here? Okay, let's let's take the floor eh, if you're here. I'm 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 here. Hello, Stuart. Okay. Um, okay. So you, you want to share some some doubts you 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 had uh, in your discussion? Well, my my position is um, I think because partly because Australia is so far away, it's been uh, forgotten about in relation to social ecology. We de we developed our program way back in the eighties, mm -hmm. and we've graduated probably three or 400 masters and PhD students. And to, to enable them to do that, we had to develop research methodology, which is completely in line with Bookchin's ideas and emphasizing particularly participatory action research and transformational processes and uh, whole systems and with an emphasis on, on redesign of whole systems from the personal level to the global level with political in the middle. Um, so there's a long history of doing this. And my sense is that most people who are, are trying to do research in social ecology in the rest of the world are unaware of any of this work that we've done. Um, so, so it's a bit hard to listen to um, ideas that the, the that this hasn't been developed because we have, have a long, you know, 40 plus year history of uh, doing this. Mm -hmm. But I think, Stuart, you will have the chance to present. Your, yeah, yeah, uh, I, I understand uh, that. In the, in the I, second session. No? I, was just, uh, I was just responding focus. to your question. Okay, thank you so much for sharing. Maybe Federico, did you hear this uh, uh, queries? Maybe you want to to answer in a, in a very short way, uh, to what extent uh, this Australian uh, development on, on, of uh, this methodology on, of, um, on research is not for you that much uh, compatible with Bookshin? Yes, um, thank you. Um, thank you for the question. Um, so mm -hmm. I baby? do agree that, um, yeah, this is Marco. Um, I do agree that um, the social ecology in Australia has a long tradition. Um, and I'm one of the few, I think, in the Western countries uh, to have read one of the book uh, that you published. And uh, the second one you will also present uh, uh, tonight. So I'm, I'm, I'm a bit familiar with your work. Uh, and I tend to agree that um, maybe the experiences in Australia are not very well known uh, abroad and uh, we should know more. And this is also why I pushed to have uh, um, your book presentation in, in this conference uh, in order to build uh, links between different traditions. At the same time, I'm, I'm not 100% sure if the, these traditions are compatible. Um, I think that they are the, the, the also the thinkers that are referring to are different and they developed in in um, in different paths. So I'm not 100 percent sure if uh, the social ecology has been defined by Bookchin, 
is, um, is similar for sure of the work that you have done there, but at the same time is also, there are differences. So, so I'm not sure, I'm, but again, if you have any, any material that you are, that you think that are relevant in order to develop a research approach and uh, to strengthen better the links uh, and so on, I'm very welcome to, to receive and, and to, to read them. So thank you, thank you for your suggestion. Okay, is it okay, Stuart, so that maybe we can further this sure. discussion after your presentation? Sure. Okay, okay. I, and I'm, then we are I, here in the chat. I don't have a visual, I, I'm not on visually, so you can't see me showing myself. Okay, okay, yes. Uh, so we will, uh, we have here in the chat your email so that maybe people who would like to know further about this issue of, uh, of your practices can also write to you. Foundation Chair and Emeritus Professors of Social Ecology, uh, Stuart Hill. Uh, so here is your, um, here is your address. So we have a last question for, uh, for Federico. Could the approach of oral history research that collects the living social and historical memory of a community be a fifth pillar of the overall research matrix? Federico, are you with us? As, as I'm, as I'm, as already answered, I'm not familiar with this approach, and I would say, why not? And I've been already in contact with the uh, with the person that made the, the question, and will okay. share. Okay. So, Giorgio, so if you're here, do you want to share just uh, for a little while what is the oral history research that can be of interest for everybody? Are you here, Mr. Giorgio? Yes, I'm here, okay. Um, uh, oral history research is a quite recent type of research. Uh, done by historians, but sociologists and uh, other kinds of social scientists, even anthropologists. And the idea is to collect uh, through narratives, uh, through uh, discussion with uh, various community members, to collect information about their personal history and the communal history of the persons living there. So it is a kind of uh, creating archives of the public social and historical memory that communities have experienced, which is not officially written. It doesn't exist in books because it's based on personal uh, uh, memories, uh, events, how public uh, situations uh, have been uh, experienced personally or uh, communally. Uh, by various social categories in communities, which means subaltern groups, uh, marginalized groups, uh, in a sense, uh, obtain a voice through this kind of oral research, uh, oral history research, and uh, it becomes recorded and uh, becomes visible, whereas formerly was invisible, to use this expression of rendering the visible, visible. So I think okay. it's, it's, it's important. Thank you, Georgios. Uh, thank you for this uh, precision. Uh, we have a last question, but uh, for uh, Eve and Crini, who are not here, uh, unfortunately. So Laura, uh, Laura, uh, I would uh, suggest you to, to write uh, directly to them uh, because your question is, is very interesting. Uh, can you elaborate on the specific elements of the school you run in Cork that are influenced by social ecology? Specifically, is a school run in a way that involves the students in a participatory democracy about the way the school is run? Do the students have a say in the school's rules and, and policies? So uh, I don't know if you have written down the... Uh, the address that was at the end of the presentation, if you want, we will write it again in the in the chat so that you can directly address uh, to them or I'm, I'm okay, thank you, Theo. And uh, if you want to get um, in touch directly, I think this this is the best way. 
uh, but thank you for sharing your answer. And Venturini, uh, Federico also let his uh, address. So I suggest you go forward uh, so that we can have the presentation of the, of the two books we have uh, to end this conference. So uh, we have a presentation of um, the book Ecological Solidarity and the Kurdish Freedom Movement uh, from Lexington Books. It is a very recent book uh, published in 2021. Uh, I think here, I'm really sorry because uh, I don't know that much the, um, uh, the, the people here, uh, the people's uh, names, but I, uh, that will present these books. Theo, Theo gave them to me. So please, if you're here. Uh, shall, I, um, shall I get started? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank Michaela. you so much, so, <laughs> because I was a little bit lost. Yeah, okay, as long so as you can hear, hear me. As long as you can hear me okay, thank you very much. So yeah, I mean, when you say it's very recent, um, I was actually hoping that I'd be able to wave it at you today, but I actually, um, yeah, so recent, it's going to be published this month, so I'm, I'm expecting it to appear um, any moment. I know it's been dispatched, but I don't actually have a copy of the hard copy with me already, but um, but now I've been here, I've been at the Trees Conference for two days, I've really, really enjoyed it, so yeah, really like to thank the uh, the organisers and the contributors for your, for your contributions. And um, yeah, it's been absolutely fascinating uh, conference over the last couple of days. But thanks also for uh, giving us the opportunity to talk about the, the publication of Ecological Solidarity and the Kurdish Freedom Movement. Um, I, I've been editing the book. So what I, what I thought would probably be the best approach is I'm not, I'm not actually quite sure who, who's here, but I think there's several of the contributors um, to the book here. So obviously we've heard from Federico and we've heard from Marlena, who are two, two of the contributors. Um, possibly, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, Dilsha Deniz may be here and maybe also Fabiana Sioni. So maybe maybe if you could pop into the chat if you're here. Um, I, I think in the meantime, um, yeah, we're, we're just trying to establish who's, who's present at the conference now. Okay, yeah, Fred, Federico's already already spoken. I think otherwise, uh, uh, Fabio is here, so that's brilliant. Yeah, um, maybe what I'll do is I will do a little bit of an out an outline of um, how the book came to be, um, its connections with Marie Bookchin, um, not not exclusively Marie Bookchin, in fact, um, and then I'll give other contributors uh, an opportunity to um, to speak, maybe give a bit of an outline of um, of their contributions as well. That would be fantastic. So, I mean, I, the, the way I came to, to um, be interested in um, the Kurdish freedom movement was from my interest in social ecology. So that was my my um, introduction, I suppose, to the to the Kurdish struggle and that revolutionary project um, was brought about through through Murray Bookchin and um, I suppose most conspicuously in Rojava, um, or now is called Anais. Um, for those who really those who cared to look at the situation there have seen the emergence of a real uh, a living revolutionary situation, um, very much imbued with Bookchin's ideas. Um, and there's uh, attempts there to, I mean, this is going back to some of the, the territory we looked at yesterday when we started, I'm going to make a return to the Kurdish freedom movement. Um, there were attempts, um, attempts to integrate social ecology um, and communalism into really audacious program for authentic and far-reaching social transformation and really in the most challenging circumstances also almost imaginable in the in uh, in the Kurdish areas at the moment so the origins of the ecological solidarity and the Kurdish freedom movement uh, I'd say probably came from a what I'd call a scoping article that I wrote in 2016 that was uh, really looking at the kind of what, what I felt was the kind of under, at that time, certainly under researched area of um, the ecological pillar of the uh, movement for democratic confederalism. So this was published in Capitalism, Nature and Socialism um, early the following year in 2017 as prospects for Kurdish ecology initiatives in Syria and Turkey. Uh, Looking through back through my notes, I can see that I was reading uh, Janet Beale's book, Ecology or Catastrophe, 
at that time earlier in 2016 and I also heard um, and had contact with uh, both Janet Beal and Erjan Iboga who's the founder of the Mesopotamia ecology movement at um, a seminar on democratic confederalism in Brighton in that year um, and I know Dimitri mentioned yesterday that the epilogue to, to Beale's book biography of Murray Bookchin talks about that contact between Abdullah Ojalan and uh, Murray Bookchin's text um, and the contact through an intermediary, um, the lawyer um, and ac academic Rima Haider in mid-2004, mid uh, uh, after Ojalan had been reading Bookchin's text. Um, in particular, I think the ecology of freedom, which is mentioned several times is, if you like, um, perhaps Bookchin's magnum opus, also uh, remaking society from urbanization to cities where he first sort of starts to outline um, libertarian uh, municipalism while he was in, in prison during the previous, uh, at that time. So he'd been reading that during the previous two years. Bookchin responded very positively and he was pleased, really pleased to hear the influence of ideas, but it sort of turned out that that was really near the end of his life. So there was no sustained um, dialogue between them. Um, but from Ojalan's side, uh, Yus Yongadan records that he said to his lawyers in late 2004, the worldview for which I stand is close to that of Bookchin. And although he read right widely, it was Bookchin and perhaps Emmanuel Wallerstein in particular that he most identified with. So moving forward to uh, 2020, I was contacted at that time uh, by Mike Gibson, the, the acquisitions editor of Roman and Littlefield at that time, uh, who'd read the essay, was very enthusiastic and felt that the contact, the content should be developed into a, a, a book. Mostly for reasons of representation, I'd say that um, I negotiated that it would take the form of uh, an edited collection, which felt far more democratic. Um, clearly, I'm not I'm not Kurdish, um, but it would enable the topic to be explored in a polyvocal approach with multiple themes and voices. It would be more, the idea was it would be accessible. Um, it, it would enable the inclusion of, the other thing was would it enable the inclusion of first hand accounts of people of, of, of experience in the, in the Kurdish region um, and those projects. It would also open up some critical analysis and exposure of relevant literature that's perhaps been published in, in Turkish or Kurdish or other languages, so that that would be again available to an English speaking readership. So I was really pleased and immensely um, thankful to all those who, who responded very positively to the call um, for papers. Um, and I really had very few problems in that, in that uh, respect. I think people understood that it was a timely and a significant area of research. I'm really pleased that um, several of the um, contributors have taken part in the TRIS conference. So I know that uh, uh, Federico is here. Um, we've just heard from Marlena. Um, I think F Fabiana's uh, Sione is here as well. So that, that would be great to, um, maybe if Fabiana wants to speak as well. Um, possibly Dilsha uh, Denise. Um, so you can obviously, the best thing is to do is to hear some of these voices for yourself. So I suppose that's a little bit of an anecdotal um, account of how the book came to be about. I'm going to tack in a slightly different direction now in, in respect between the, the, the relationship between Murray Bookchin and Abdullah Ojalan. Um, so probably not to most attendees at the conference, but it should be acknowledged that the ecological aspect may seem like a bit of an offshoot of the Kurdish freedom movement, perhaps a little bit obscure um, and it's linked, um, linked to a conflict which itself um, is largely absent from public discourse in terms of uh, certainly the mainstream media um, in the UK, even the, the wider Syrian war is really rarely noticed at the moment. Um, but I felt and I really do feel strongly that the ecological aspect touches upon every aspect of the wider revolution that's happening in that area and tackling the ecological crisis as others have said over the last couple of days um, is a progressive and a reconstructive project of the main challenge confronting humanity so predictably um, 
so far the consideration of the systemic causes and to the ecological crisis has largely been absent from the many discussions that have been taking place about in the in the run up to the um, as we approach the COP26 conference in in Glasgow this year. So I think it's really timely and and this systemic approach is is more important than ever. So the theme of ecological solidarity is of fundamental and critical importance since this increasingly alarming evidence that the global ecological crisis is at the point where in disrupting habitats and colonizing land, capitalism threatens to burn and crash and is already taking other species with it and destroying human communities as it does so. From the time of the emergence of the modern political ecology movement during the 1960s, not always acknowledged, but very much um, linked to um, Bookchin's very early intervention at that time. Uh, it has become clear that it's immensely difficult to achieve social justice, um, sustain decent livelihoods and achieve revolutionary changes necessary for fuller social realization where there's an extensive destruction of the, the living world. The book, however, is not about documenting and chronic, chronicling more um, imminent disasters, but it's rather about looking at the way that a hybrid of ideas and practical initiatives inspired by Bookchin and Ojalan are shaping the paradigm for resilience and change. The first thing to say is that there's important aspects of the Kurdish movement's concern for the living world that predate Ojalan's reading of Bookchin. And I think probably since I came to the Kurdish issues through broadly libertarian, socialist, eco-socialist or anarchist circles, this is something probably with the benefit of hindsight, I come to see that didn't sufficiently realise and acknowledge in the original scoping article. The second thing is to observe the, um, the, the complementary and relationship between uh, Bookchin and Ojalan, the integrated ideas of both form a critique of what they hold to be social causes of ecological destruction and develop provisional but solid proposals to bring about a radical transformation and what they hope would be the basis for at least a dialogue about realizable alternatives. So the exploration of the multifaceted aspects of ecological solidarity that emerges from this, I think is the, the overarching, the key themes of the, the collection of essays. And there are 22 contributors altogether. So there are many perspectives that, um, and a lot of territory and different aspects of that um, ecological crisis in relation to the Kurdish struggle that are covered there. Just to mention a few ways that we can identify elements of ecological sensibility before the early years of the new millennium, when Ojalan started to read, discovered and started to read Bookchin's works intensively. First of all, there's the age old contact between the peoples living in the Kurdish region and the natural world. A significant example would be the Alavi belief systems and their respect for other species. So, if, so uh, yeah, again, Dilsha is the expert here and has written a fascinating chapter about this, um, would be able to tell you more um, if, if Dilsha is here today. Um, and it's a contribution also contributed by another um, accompanying chapter on Dersim as a Sacred Land by Dr. Ahmet Kerim Goltigind. Another important but more recent precursor that the Kurdish movement also um, it, is that the Kurdish movement also is linked into the anti-globalization movement of the 1990s. So this had a strong component of ecological concern. Um, in particular, as you'll know, many of the Kurdish revolutionaries were inspired by the, the, the Zapatista uprising, which was a valuable um, inspiration as a struggle against colonialism and extractivism, neoliberalism, um, ecological solidarity, solidarity forms some of the common ground in this mutual struggle. So the Zapatistas began to identify the seizure of land and natural products such as trees and fossil fuels as commodities, part of the, tech, part of the ideology of extractivism that using the pretense of supporting livelihoods led to the dispossession and impoverishment of in, indigenous peoples. So the relevance for Kurdistan there was really clear, I think. And this continues to the present day. So as we speak, the Zapatistas are undertaking a tour of um, Europe in 2021. 
And that's again accompanied by strong statements linking, uh, relating to the ecological crisis and capitalism, feminism, and the resurgence of nationalism and chauvinism. And there are other similar um, parallels, I think, with the Mapuche struggle in Chile at the moment, which again, similarly has a strong ecological anti-colonial dimension. Relatedly to the anti-globalization movement, I think the anti-dam connect campaigns have formed an environmentally concerned movement, which was underway in the 1990s and which have developed over the following decades. They were already concerned about the impact of dams on Kurdish populations and also others such as the Marsh Arabs and other um, groups downstream um, by the time of the Rio Earth Summit right back in 1992. So international efforts to oppose the GAP project, uh, which threatened the high profile ancient settlement at Hassan Kif, discussed in the collection by Dr. Laurent Dissard, were mobilized from the late 1990s onwards by the time that the, um, by which time the annual Manza Culture and Nature Festivals were happening, as again referenced in the book by Ahmet Kerem Goltikind. Um, I think it's important to say none of this in any way underestimates or detracts from Murray Bookchin's critically important influence upon Murray, uh, upon Ojalan or the wider free Kurdish freedom movement. But I think it rather helps us to, exp to consider the material and cultural factors um, in place and explain why political ecology and in particular Bookchin's advanced thought was to be so positively received what is great interest now is how we place Bookchin's pioneering and foundational ideas so that they continue to be applied and developed. This has to be done with nuance since as Shihad Hami argues in his chapter on social ecology and Ojalan thinking, there has been a tendency either to exaggerate the impact of Bookchin on the Kurdish freedom movement, or on the other hand, to significantly underestimate or overlook his relevance. Uh, Federico, um, opens the, the theoretical work of the book by deline delineating the value and the relevance of social ecology as a, as a body of ideas put forward by Bookchin and subsequently contested and adapted. Jihad Hami goes on to look at what Ojalan takes from Bookchin and develops and reworks in the context of Kurdistan and the Middle East. Again, Hami is also clear that much of the journey of transformation in Ojalan's thinking predates his reading of Bookchin and also derives from a wider body of political thought. For example, one area where there is a different emphasis in Ojalan's writings, he suggests, is the greater priority given to anti-patriarchal ideas leading to the role of genealogy in the Kurdish movement. To gloss Hamid's contribution, what Ojalan adapted from Bookchin was first and foremost, a shift from the growing awareness of the destruction of the living world um, to a point where he increasingly came to think of ecology as a central issue and part of the program for Kurdish liberation and indeed human liberation, rather than simply one of the negative impacts caused by capitalism. Bookchin's work on hierarchy and domination had the extension of the critique of capitalism from the, his extension of the critique of capitalism from the economic and social to the ecological sphere, noting the system, current systems, exploitation and destruction of the natural world. His ideas about liberatory technology all helped to develop his thinking. And perhaps above all, Bookchin's ideas about libertarian municipalism or communalism significantly influenced the direction towards a paradigm of democratic autonomy or confederalism. Um, I've got, I'm not sure that it's really necessary for me to um, outline all of the contributions to, the, I, I would quite like to uh, sort of go through the, the, the contributions to the, in a more comprehensive way that the book as a whole. I think perhaps I'll skip over for that from now and then um, we'll see what other co contributions we have from other contributors to the book. I'll just um, conclude with a few other thoughts, but we can come back to that if that proves useful. Um, I'd say probably from here and now, I think the one of the fascinating aspects of course, is that the social movements in the West, including those that embrace political ecology, they've since looked to Ojalan and the Kurdish revolutionaries and they've re-imported the ideas back from the uh, Middle East 
and then seeking inspiration from them. So Bookchin, with his Russian and Jewish heritage, drew upon Greek and other classical philosophy, and he was steeped in Western revolutionary thought, influenced the politics of the, the Kurdish movement in the Middle East. And then Ojalan adopted uh, social ecology as part of what Nujin Derya has recently referred to as the redefinition of the idea of revolution due to its role in the development of a new reality. The Kurdish movement, with its ecological turn, has now been it, uh, re-exported back to inspire sections of Western social movements transmitted by members of the Kurdish diaspora and prominent Western commentators and supporters who have visited uh, Rojava, such as Debbie Bookchin and the late David Graeber and many others. So we should ask and explore further what is rejected and what is taken up and what is changed in each of these reiterations and cultural translations. Importantly, and I think encouragingly, experiments in North and East Syria in particular, including their ecological dimension, have inspired initiatives such as Cooperation Jackson, Symbiosis, the Municipalists of Barcelona, and I'm sure it goes without saying, the Transnational Institute for Social Ecology um, and counterparts in the United States. Instances of democratic confederalism beyond the Kurdish movement and prospects for scaling across to further context in future is a topic that I introduced in one of the concluding chapters of the collection. And so most importantly, how does this body of ideas embracing integrated elements of ecological solidarity, women's liberation, multi-ethnic direct democracy in the context of a solidarity economy, how does that help us to resist and build and to scale up to meet the challenges of this desperately and un unstable and dangerous moment of history where crisis has become our everyday normality? What I think is certain is that Murray Bookchin's ideas and those of ongoing currents in social ecology will continue to form the foundation for the conversations to come. I think I'll finish there and see whether other Give, the, give opportunity for other contributors to maybe give an outline and uh, contribute as well. We go very short yeah. time uh, okay. for the time, I, I have to say. So you mentioned that Fabia, maybe Fabia. If Fabia's there. She told that uh, she had a bad connection. So may, maybe yeah. you can just wrap up and, and then uh, we can ask Fabia to have a little um, words, to have little words, but, but we have to go further, uh, unfortunately. So thank you for concluding, Stefan. Okay. Okay, so you had an, uh, uh, another thing to say? Sorry, I, I misunderstood. Or, or do you want to let the floor to, to Fabia if she can talk? Uh, yeah, no, I'll open up to any, any, yeah, any of the contributors. Thank you. Okay, any of the contributors, are you here? Uh, to to share some some words about uh, maybe a, a particular yes uh, yes Magali I okay. I would like to add on, yes I I just would like to draw from what uh, Stephen just has said about the book uh, that it provides a very practical a um, very practical thoughts in 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 an overview of con of ongoing practices in a uh, on Kurdish realities that provide uh, the insights that uh, social ecology and communalism inspired by butching uh, thoughts and ideas have been put into practice and that can be developed and actually put, uh, provide practical insights to, uh, to develop uh, these ideas in the current world in crisis in different crises that can provide real meaningful opportunities to, um, to implement in real world, in, in especially in social uh, ecology ideas, so much needed now in the context of ecological and climate crisis. Just that because I know that you are uh, running out of time. Thank you very much. So maybe you, you you could share it here in the chat um, the 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 link of the 
where we can get the book because I understand that it will be soon available. Stefan, it would be nice because uh, you gave us a lot of uh, of appetites. Uh, uh, we would like to discover it. With, we would discover Okay, it I'll just uh, I'll just put that. I'm just going to share the link now. Please. Yeah. Okay. yeah. How, how much time do we have? Do you want me to sort of run through a bit of a taste of what's in there as well? A couple of paragraphs? <laughs> or do you want me to... Uh, I don't know whether ah, there is anybody else speaking that's... Um, 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 so any other contributors are speaking. So I think Federico has already spoken and uh, um, yes. Marlene has spoken. I think if there is a particular paragraph you can read us in two minutes, it would be nice. <laughs> Uh, because actually we go a little bit late and uh, I think this is uh, being quite hard to get um, to get okay. concentrated to to stay concentrated uh, in uh, uh, behind the screen so I would suggest to 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 be equitative with the other presentation not to stay so much so you can have yeah. two more minutes so that we can finish on time please two more minutes eh? thank you Okay, thank you. I was just, I'll, I'll run through the um, some more information about the book itself. So I suppose what it's trying to provide, as I was saying earlier, is a co coherent, multi-dimensional and holistic view of some of the key factors uh, relating to attempts to implement the ecological pillar of democratic confederalism, which I said it has, I feel, um, there is literature out there, but there's not really been a comprehensive effort to bring this together. So it starts off with... Um, it really acknowledges the sur and surveys the significant challenges that, that confront the project at the outset. Um, the opening section deals with the theoretical aspects of the relationship between political ecology, more specifically social ecology and the Kurdish struggle. Um, so Federico um, talks about social ecology as a valuable thinking tool um, because despite with convention, uh, contentions within the philosophy, it provides not only a powerful critique of the prevailing statist capitalist and patriarchal forms of hierarchy and domination, uh, but also a constructive program of radical social transformation. Uh, I've mentioned Jihad Hami, looking at Ojalan's engagement. Um, Onjin Sustam considers the emergence of the ecological dimension as a part of the Kurdish movement's dynamism and resistance in the neoliberal era. Uh, Nick Hilljard, a campaigner with the new, uh, with the, the Corner House, talks about Kurdish issues. Uh, he's been involved with Kurdish issues for more, more than two decades. Uh, he considers the challenges that the Kurdish movement faces in decolonizing the mindset and languages of so-called green capitalism. The, so there's obviously ample evidence of the ecological destruction and con con concomitant social instability and in, in, injustice globally within the Middle East. So the second section of the, the, the collection, however, considers um, positive endeavors to build practical ecological initiatives and experiments within the Kurdish movement. Um, so Erjan Ayaboga, co-author of the Revolution in Rojava, explains the way that the ecological assemblies are embedded within the wider structures of the Kurdish freedom movement, um, sharing the same features of grassroots democracy and co-chair system. Uh, again, in the overarching political arena, early in the summer, I was able to interview uh, Mackenzie Kizildir, uh, who was the co-spokesman, sorry, co-spokesperson for the HDP or the, the People's Democratic um, Party Ecological Mission Commission in Turkey. And I was really impressed by the way that she was passionate about the, um, the determination of the HDP to get across the those politics of the um, climate change and the ecological crisis, even as, as they're being suppressed by the by Erdogan's um, Justice and Development par um, Party, um, because they felt that this, the political campaigns are essential um, within and beyond Parliament, and because they regard the protection of the living world as a priority to maintain some of the livelihoods and to promote social justice for all of the communities. Uh, how, how are we doing? Do you want me to um, carry on? We are, we are, we are, we are, uh, we have to close. Uh, all right, I won't go through the, uh, all of so the, uh, uh, should I just say that there are other sections yes. on the relationship between uh, the Kurdish freedom movement mm -hmm. and uh, social movements for environmental activism. 
The fourth section is about the natural world in the wisdom traditions of Kurdish Alevism. And then the final, um, the final section is around the conflict and the connection between um, the West's complicity in the arms trade, supplying arms, and also the use of, of uh, forest fires is an ecological, uh, the weaponization of ecology. So those are the other sections, but I won't go through all of that you. detail thank for you today. Okay, thank you. You mentioned uh, HDP and uh, people from uh, uh, Turkish uh, Kurdistan and uh, we have to also remember uh, the comrades that have been repressed and uh, are in, were in jail. Uh, some of them came to our conferences uh, in Thessaloniki or, or have, have, um, have been forced to, to go uh, out of uh, Turkey. Uh, Diyarbakir's uh, mayor was in jail and I think she is still in. So yes, uh, also give this memory to the people who has worked uh, from these um, communalist alternatives in the Turkey, Turkish part, I have to, I have to say. Uh, so probably we can um, we can give the speech now to um, to David Wright and uh, Stuart Hill to to introduce uh, their uh, book on social ecology and education, um, transforming worldviews and practices. Um, so please. David, if you want to understand, to begin. Can we, can, we, um, yeah. can we be allowed to have our visual things attached? Because it's it, it says the, the video is, is blocked. Uh, sorry, I didn't get that much your, your it, question. It says the video, the video of us is blocked. It needs to be unblocked. Okay, okay. Are so you? Yavor and, and Joanna, maybe uh, as organizers, you can help us to unblock the to unblock the the video so that David can share his screen. Yeah, I'm, yeah, we're here. Oh, Stuart, ah, oh, Stuart. Okay, okay, you're both here. So let's go. So sure. do you want me yeah. to go, or do you want to go yeah, first? David. Yeah. Okay. Oh, now I've I've disappeared again. Um, no, I've I'm now I'm you. now disappeared. No, we can see you. You, you oh, we can I, see you, David. It's okay for us. Oh, okay. And we can hear um, you and see you. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me just. No, no, can you? Um, I just preface. Um, the, something about our program in social ecology with my involvement with Bookchin. Um, back in the 60s, I did the first whole ecosystem study. And so my background was in ecology. And I read Bookchin's first book, which he published not under his name, but another name called the Synthet Our Synthetic Environment. And it was published the same year as, as Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. And I remember reading the two books and thinking um, what a rich book Bookchins was in that it covered a much wider area than, than Rachel Carson. And very sadly, the environmental movement was dated from Rachel Carson rather than Murray Bookchin which in my mind it should have been dated from because he produced a, a much broader and deeper and comprehensive understanding of uh, this. Um, following this, I established in 1974, the first institute in a university on sustainable agriculture. Um, and that was very much in line with Bookchin's concepts of connection with nature and an ecologically based food system. Um, and in 1978, I organized, co organized the first international conference on ecologically sustainable organic agriculture. And it was the first conference to bring together uh, speakers from around the world um, that came to Montreal, where um, for um, Stephen's uh, information was where 
Wallerstein was a, was a, prof a, a professor along with me. So there were some very influential people at McGill at that time. At that time, um, I also um, was a regular participant in the NOFA conferences, which were the Natural Organic Farming Association conferences in the New England area. And there were a lot of people there who were familiar with Bookchin's ideas. And so there was a discussion about Bookchin and, and so forth. Um, and around that time, Bookchin actually invited me to come and do some teaching in his program in Goddard. Um, so I was very familiar with Bookchin's ideas. I'd read, subsequently read his um, post-scarcity anarchism and read his, his various other books at various times. So we were very, I was very influenced and familiar with his ideas. Um, I also realized he was coming from a very different place than I was. I was coming from an ecological place. He was coming from a um, more socio-political place. Um, and, um, but I thought we, we were compatible in our understanding. Um, he was very angry about things that were going on in the world. I was much more focused on how do you re redesign things ecologically to do something about them. And so when I came to social ecology in the 90s in Australia, it was a breath of fresh air to find another group of people who had also been thinking about social ecology ideas, which brought together the social and the ecological and in Australia, much more the personal than in Bookchin's programs. So there was a, a psychosocial element in the Australian programs. And so we were, it was an educational program in a university. So we were very influenced, not just by Bookchin, but by the cutting edge revolutionary educators and, uh, and thinkers of that time. And so we, had a program that was um, based on action learning. There were no exams. There was a lot of collaboration and all the research was action research. Um, and so <clears throat> it's true that we were influenced by people other than Bookchin, but um, we were an academic institution. So we looked very broadly about uh, resources that could could enrich our, our student, students' learning and so forth. Um, so our program was um, very much concerned with whole person engagement in the sense, the head, the heart, the hands um, and everything else, which for some people they labeled spiritual, but for me, I labeled the unknown. And I have a very, um, great respect for what we don't know as opposed to what we do know. And I, I think this was a, a, a valuable addition to what Bookchin's program offered. Um, we were activist and oriented rather than conceptually oriented. Um, and so all our students were doing projects in the community, enabling social transformation and personal transformation and so forth. And there were thousands of those students over the years of the social ecology program. Um, we were particularly concerned with whole systems redesign um, and, and, the, and the whole concept of, of designing systems that can work, which was in a sense what Bookchin was advocating, but we were actually out there doing it um, across the full spectrum of the possibilities of doing things. Um, as I said, we had much more of a psychosocial understanding of the causes of our problems. We, like Bookchin, we recognize the problems of capitalism and, and hierarchy and all of these sort of things. But we also included an understanding of the, what I call, in, I also practice as a psychotherapist, um, psychological shit inheritance, which is, 
is uh, where people are just acting out their, their psychological distresses and they're collaborating with one another to, to form groups that perpetuate those distresses. And so we had that psychological inclusion. Um, we focused a lot on um, problems, not seeing them as enemies and things to document, but rather as indicators of maldesign, mismanagement, and um, and 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 these psychological roots of some of these problems, um, we we focused a lot on collaboration across difference. And so, in Australia, because of the Aboriginal issues, a lot of our understanding built on Indigenous ways of knowing and women's ways of knowing, and and other way, alternative ways of knowing. Um, and all of our, our work emphasized the role of power in, and, and, and how power has been misused and, um, and the importance of clarifying our visions and values and expanding our awareness beyond the sort of narrow confines of most of the very narrow trainings. So just to, to end my bit, um, the things we particularly got from Bookchin were um, classically all the things that he was against. We agreed with him, his, his concern with hierarchy, domination, unlimited growth of production and consumption, um, the power of multinationals and transnationals and capital concentrated capitalism, uh, the technological responses to, to social problems instead of dealing with social solutions, the whole phenomena of reductionism and postmodernism, um, the whole ego individualistic focus of so many people which led him to, to, to some ways abandon um, his, his, his love of anarchy uh, be, ha, it having been taken over by a lot of individualistic anarchy approaches. Um, we agreed with him on the problems of fossil fuel based energy and industrial chemical based agriculture. Um, and we also favored with him the um, influence of Aristotle and the limitations of Plato's uh, religious mystic um, inductive logic approach to everything and all the people who followed him. And although in social ecology, there was a great diversity of, um, because of our approach to inclusiveness, to spirituality, um, I was one of the people who was very clear that I, I didn't believe in a God and I, and I saw the whole religious approach as a, a, a maladaptation to dealing with understanding. And so for me, that whole area that for some people they label spiritual, I labeled the unknown. And I was very influenced by, um, by some, some work of others who've written about unknowing that the majority of what is, is unknown. And, and that only a very small part amount of, of what we, we engage with is, in quotes, known. And tragically, what's taught in university and increasingly is limitedly taught in university is the known because you can examine it and, and carry out studies on it and all that sort of stuff. Um, and the unknown is what we engage with through our feelings, through our experience, and it's, off, it's much more emphasized in women's ways of knowing and indigenous knowing and, and, um, and, and is expressed in wisdom. Um, whereas what's, what's expressed in the knowing area is cleverness. And cleverness is part of the problem that we face is our overemphasis on cleverness and the exclusion of wisdom just because it's not measurable and, and unknown. So that's probably enough from me. I think David will Thank enrich you, some of this more. 
Thank you. Thank you for sharing also this uh, holistic approach of uh, human uh, uh, based on Bookshin South, but also um, this holistic approach you tried to develop uh, as a searcher in the university uh, with your uh, with uh, with your um, pupils and the students. So, David, would you add uh, something maybe on the describing all the books and its contents? Yes, well, sure. I, I think David will do that. Yes, yep. definitely. Yeah, the, the book, there, there are two books we've done over the last recent years. The, Frederica held up one and showed us this one, uh, Social Ecology, Applying Ecological Understanding to Our Lives and Our Planet. And I think the key issue in there is, is ecological understanding how we work with an ecological understanding in an educational environment to deepen and extend effectiveness. Uh, there's a sort of a major focus on effectiveness in, in our programs and how we can actually take conceptual issues and introduce them uh, to communities. Uh, so I did an interview recently with... Um, one of our graduates who became a member of the Australian Parliament. And she said, what I got from social ecology was how to be effective. And she became effective because of the ways in which she constructed networks and communities and uh, built those communities to power nodes. And those power nodes have become extraordinarily influential to a point where there's sort of an independent movement in Australian politics that is, that is, um, that is groundbreaking at present times. Uh, the second book was called, which is just published this year, was called uh, this one, Social Ecology and Education, Transforming Worldviews and Practices. And the issue of transformation has been central to our practice as well, in the sense that uh, as a university department, that through the various political machinations of the system, found ourselves within the ambit of education, we discovered ourselves dealing essentially with learning and learning as a social ecological phenomena. And that process of learning involves many things. It involves a relationship to the world, the external world, but it also involves a relationship to the internal world. Who am I in this process? Who am I in this experience of finding a voice and maintaining that voice and extending that voice into the community beyond. So there's a strong self-reflective component within the programs that we've constructed. How do we understand ourselves in relationship to the particular power structures that we're part of? And these have been extraordinarily influential. So our graduates or our students, you know, work in the areas of, 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 of uh, health, of welfare, of education, uh, racial politics, uh, community politics. There's a strong sort of um, a strong sort of sense of uh, what they do. So, with all of the subjects, with all the the, the coursework that we do, that the, the idea is how how have you changed your environment, your experience through working with these particular ideas? Tell us the story of what happened, and uh, and and we engage with this systematically. We've argued consistently that social ecology is not a dogma. Social ecology is a way of building understanding and it comes from the social ecology of its construction. So the social ecology of the construction of our, I guess our sort of orientation is determined in part by, by our geography, by our demographics, by our students themselves. And we exist on the Western fringe of a large urban metropolis where uh, drawing students from all around Australia and from New Zealand, those students come to us as mature people, mature learners. They're not undergraduates. They come to us mature learners who are already active and effective within the world. We engage with them, not to a point of, uh, of, of, um, of producing, uh, telling them what to think, telling, telling, giving them theory to, to a, a, a align with, but through uh, facilitating the emergence of understanding that deepens and enriches social, social ecological perspectives. And this has been sort of central to our activities over time. Uh, we've been influenced considerably by 
by the movements in Vermont, the Institute of Social Ecology, and, 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 and I visited and talk, met with the sort of staff in, in Vermont and, and recognize also there are differences to the way social ecology manifests in Vermont as it does in, in, in Western, Western Sydney, as it does in, in Los Angeles, as it does in different sorts of other environments that have to do with the particular environment of its emergence, particular environments of its construction. The influence of Bookchin is present in our program, but we're not a school that, in, in a sense, sort of uh, teaches Bookchin. Uh, I, I guess that um, when, I, when I hear Stephen talk about the experience of the Kurdish movements uh, and, and, and his papers sort of circulated amongst our students, I hear someone talking about uh, facilitating the emergence or contributing to the facilitation of emergence of a conscious social action process. And I see us doing as equivalent things in a sort of, in a different sort of environment, in a different, in a different culture, in a, in a, uh, in a, in a different sort of system. So um, I think that's probably en enough to say, except to the extent that we have been in a way victims of our own success within the institution that we initially started talking about issues of sustainability and issues of ecological understanding in our university in the 90s when very few people were it's now being talked about much more effectively and much more extensively and these issues have permeated into other sectors and other disciplines within the university to a point where now the university finds it very easy to ignore us and our influence. And um, we've been sort of marginalized and sidelined, uh, you know, by this process. But the, the experience that, 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 that we've, we've worked through has been extensive. The book that we've worked on has contributors from Canada, from Scandinavia, from New Zealand, from Malaysia. It works several articles working with indigenous knowledge systems, several articles working with uh, forms of pedagogy, articles on uh, wild approaches to wild pedagogy, you know, experience of place and how place educates in very powerful ways, uh, confrontations with uh, ways in which tertiary education systems have undermined the cross disciplinary approaches that we find central to effective practice uh, and more. Um, but, you know, the, the publications that we've sort of generated have been an afterthought because our principal thought has always been relationships with students, that we've seen ourselves as a form, a structure that facilitates the emergence of activists. And that's been sort of central to our work. So, so maybe I can leave it at that. We can sort of take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Yes, there is a question from Stefan. Uh, were the exchanges between the Australian pioneers of permaculture, Bill Mollison and David Holmgren, uh, and no. the social ecology movement? Yeah, well, Stuart's can... probably best to talk on that because he's had a lot of connection with David Holmgren in particular. Well, I, I did write a response to that on the, on the post. Um, okay, so, so I, we, I, I co-authored a book uh, in which we have a, a, a chapter on David Holmgren. Um, I've been a keynote speaker at um, several, the, the permaculture people call their conferences convergences. And so I, I spoke at, I think, probably the first one in North America uh, and several in Australia. Um, and when Mollison um, first came to North America, he came to stay in my house. So I have had a lot of involvement with permaculture. Um, we also, just while mentioning books, we also have published several other books. This one is um, called Changing Places, Reimagining Australia, which is typical of us working with social change at a countrywide level. Um, and just to mention other ones, we've also, um, in, in 1999, we published our first uh, journal of social ecology, which has 
quite a number of papers. And then in 2000, we produced another journal. And then subsequently, we produced um, another booklet that had publications of, of uh, social ecology articles. And for myself, I've probably published 300 plus papers in my academic career. So, and, and quite a lot of those recent, more recently have social ecology in the title. So if you search for me and, okay. and the word social ecology, you will find a whole lot of publications. Um, and I just wanna say, just like I said earlier, I think um, there is a bit of a sort of ghettoization of thinking that goes on. And, and I'm not sure how many people, you know, when they look up social ecology, take the trouble to look at the contributions from Australia. There's a massive amount of literature. And for example, we have for all the, the program, which we had a very rich program, which included things on eco-feminism, sense of place, imagination in action, um, transformative learning, leadership and change, all, so, all these things. And for all of these, we produced readers with, with key literature from across the world. Um, so for example, I would have absolutely loved to have access to uh, Stephen Hunt's and co colleagues' book on Kurdish uh, experiences, it would undoubtedly have been a, a major reading for our students. Um, so that's, that's the sort of thing we were constantly bringing to the attention of our students and, um, and, and doing that. I think the, the tragedy is that the university has just discontinued the program. Um, and it's a typical example of it being too broad and too challenging and, and not fitting easily into the highly controlled and, and, and corralled um, area that, that universities have become, you know, that, that um, and all the, I mean, my, you know, as a researcher, I could get any amount of money to, to get, funding to study problems. And that's what I call monitoring our extinction research. It's, it's the, if you want to get some money to actually bring about change, it's very, very difficult. And it's very difficult to do that research in universities if it in, integrates personal change and political change and social change and all the things that both Murray Bookchin and the various staff that we've had in social ecology in Australia uh, hold dear to our hearts. Um, and so we're increasingly, us sort of folk are having to do this outside of the university system um, or, to, or to lie about what we're doing um, and keep it hidden. Um, so I think my, my concern in a little bit in listening to some of the things that I've got to listen to is a, a little bit of concern about the, the ghettoization of Murray Bookchin's contributions and ideas and protecting it from, from uh, any influence outside. Um, the fact that Murray invited me to come down and speak in his program shows that even Murray, who was very protective of things, was open to a wild character such as myself. Um, and I think uh, we shouldn't be afraid of um, people contributing valuable ideas that, that add additional contributions to some of the things that Murray was passionate about. He, he was limited by his particular background and, and experience and, and um, you know, which was focused on, on the theory and, and the, the frameworks and, and what was a critique of what was not okay in society. But there are also lots of other very valuable contributions that can be made. I mean, such as we listened listen to from Stephen 
um, and, and some of the other people. The, the difficulty in us listening to this is um, I, I actually started listening at 3 a.m. this morning because that was the time when, uh, it, when, when I had to get up to listen to your conference. So it was, it was available at a time that's not compatible with Australian time at all. I think the other Thank issue so is much. it would be great to be actually there in person and to talk with each of you and Definitely. to sort of meet you and, and to have the bigger conversation. I think that's sort of, that's one of the other huge issues that-, that And that, have that some live. food and drink together. Definitely, yes. Well, I think you are very, uh, having a great conclusion of the conference, uh, Dr. Hill, and thank you so much, and, and, and uh, Dr. Wright. Uh, uh, I think we will stay with this opening um, uh, remark of the ghettoization of, her, um, of social ecology, or maybe the risk uh, of this ghettoization of the south of social ecology, which I'm, I'm, I'm sure is, uh, is wakening a lot of uh, reflections and 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 thoughts uh, within us now, but as you as you know, we are limited. Uh, we are limited by um, the technology <laughs> now, although it, it uh, allowed us to to gather, and it's uh, very beautiful to see here people from India, from Turkey, from Australia, from United States, from Europe, Greece, and and. Uh, Sorry for the the places I, I I've forgotten here, but it's very beautiful this uh, challenge, and I know it has been a lot of challenging uh, to build this conference because uh, I think a lot of us are very exhausted and and maybe we have kind of activism depression in a way. You know that's that's something we can feel in in a lot of activist groups uh, the the strong limitation you know, of this. Um, of this uh, digitalization of uh, of sharing, so definitely I really uh, thank the members of the board who have uh, get involved in this conference, so that we can maintain the rhythm of a two years two year um, of a conference of tries every two years. I really hope that next conference in 2023 will be a live conference with a lot of moments to share and, ex and extend the discussions around the good wine, uh, around the good meal. And, um, <laughs> and so definitely uh, we should meet again mm -hmm. and uh, we will work on this from, uh, from TRI's group, from TRI's activists. Thank you really much to uh, the people who have uh, organized the conference. Thank you for the attendees. We will share uh, the um, all all the the conferences have been filmed, so we will share it on the YouTube channel of the tries that we will receive. Uh, we will also uh, you can also uh, ask uh, more questions about tries or get involved in a way we need activists. Um, writing through the website or uh, through the Facebook. Uh, I think it's all Theo uh, or, or something else uh, from a member of TRIES. Um, it's okay. For me, it's over and I really thank for all the contributors and, and all the speakers. It's, it has been really, really interesting. Thank you so much. From uh, Saint Denis, Paris suburb, I was I was talking. Okay, so let's conclude. No, I think we can uh, we can cut if there are no other speech. Yes. Thank you, Magali. Thank you, Magali. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, cheers. Thank you very much, Magali, for moderating this last session. Thank you for... Uh...